Hi there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John, and welcome back to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss movies, both new and old, with a strictly positive critical eye. That's right, and to avoid any lazy negativity, we are making this a drinking game. (laughs) (laughs) Any Any negative criticism about a film is allowed, of course, but it will be called out. You will hear this sound. (laughs) That means... (laughs) <laughs> and that means you have to drink. Well, I guess that means one of us has to drink, but you at home, play along. Pick yeah. your favorite host or your least favorite host and play along. If you pick Dave, you're going to drink a lot. And that's how it works. <laughs> oh. So pour yourself a play glass. Play with Dave. Go fuck yourself, <laughs> Jeff, and join us and give us up for the films we love and perhaps the films mm-hmm. that need some love this week. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, perhaps. What well, the we first thing we should say is that there is um, explicit content advisory there. Thanks, Dave. Fuck no. um, so, anybody? <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to be talking about films from 1995. He's done that was it the, again. That was the year picked out by our random year generator in our previous podcast. And we chose three films from 1995 to talk about. Three films that all made a lot of money. So they have that going for them. And we'll talk about what they are after John gets through some shout outs. Oh, yeah. My shout outs, as always. We want to thank our beer sponsor. The man is still alive. He's in Queens. You know his name. Carlos Barroso. Give him a follow at Instagram. See Barroso Bar 2019. That's C-B-A-R-R-O-Z-O-B-A-R-2019. And as always, the music here on this episode. Every episode is provided by the artist Dasein. That's Dasein, D-A-S-E-I-N. You can find all this music and all the other music for free downloads. SoundCloud.com forward slash Dasein dash artist. Uh, how about yeah. the last episode, you guys? That was really fun. Was Halloween, fun. we had two guests on for yeah, anyone we went, who didn't we went join live. us for our that live. Was fun. Totally live for the first fun. time ever. Uh, Ryan and Marcus. If, if you missed it, you can catch hosts. it on our uh, Facebook page or it's also on YouTube. It's, yeah. a, it's a live it was, episode that was meant to be 90 minutes and somehow it turned out to be two hours and 40. We never expected <laughs> yeah, it to be 90 minutes, time. to be honest with you. I never expected <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was, fun. Really that was that so much fun. fun. It was really yeah. fun. Okay, so we're going to be talking about three films. We are going to be starting with Seven. 1995, we're talking about Seven. This is Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt, directed by David Fincher. I guess there's no point in keeping it a secret that Kevin Spacey does appear in the film, although he wasn't originally part of the marketing process in 1995, so he gets mm. a special double credit at the end. Kevin Spacey, we'll talk about that in a second. So we're going to open with seven. Oh, wait, and also shout out to Gwyneth Paltrow, who's awesome in this movie. Um, Mm -hmm. And then we're going to be talking about Apollo 13. So if you guys have never heard of that movie, it's called called Apollo 13. It stars, Mm -hmm. it is definitely one that comes up a lot. It's a diamond in the rough. It's definitely your um, six degrees of separation go-to if you're doing Kevin Bacon. And you're like, how can I get Tom Hanks, Gary Sinise, or Ed Harris into this Kevin Bacon conversation? And then, in our final film of the of the week that we're going to be talking about, we are going to be doing Batman and Batman Forever. Batman Forever. <laughs> Batman Forever. This is the first Joel Schumacher and the third in the Tim Burton trilogy. Tim Burton decided not to direct the third of the series, so he executive produced, passed on to Joel Schumacher, who cast. Val Kilmer to replace Michael Keaton. That is going to be our redemption film, or was it really that bad at the end of our episode? But first, before we get into our three films from 1995. Hold on, wait, really quickly, really quickly. In that last episode, we'll just go ahead and say it because he's going to be joining us later. We will have a guest uh, join us for that third, just for the redemption, just for Batman Forever. We're going to have Mr. Jeff Ronan. He is one of the co-hosts of the podcast and almost starring. It's uh, another film podcast uh, where they list out all the all the actors who played every role. They talk about the movie itself, and then they have a little game where they try to decide who else would have been fun to play certain roles to recast it, and who actually literally got the offers, who turned it down, all that fun trivia. So Jeff Ron is going to be joining us later. We will welcome him for the third and final segment. Just want to give a little shout out there because. 
I was on his podcast recently, so we're gonna scratch yeah. each other's backs. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna be yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. So yeah, stick I, I don't around. Know if he, I don't we'll be nice knows, and saucy by then. I don't know if he quite knows what it's in for, but uh, we'll we'll see what happens. No, no, we're gonna fuck you up, Jeff. I hope he's pre gaming. We're, we're gonna be we're gonna be spitting <laughs> flames by then. Spit I told him. Flames. I said you better not come on sober, dude. You better have a few drinks before you get on with us. <laughs> yeah. All right. So again, we're gonna start spitting with seven. Flames. <laughs> What you said. We're going to be starting with seven. Then we're going to be doing Apollo 13, which will be on Facebook Live. You're probably listening to this in the future, but that's what's going on. And then Batman Forever. But first, let's go around. Any news stories anybody wants to talk about? Uh, we had an election here in the United States. Yeah, this I week. think there was an election. I think, the, I think there was an election. Guys, I think yeah. the biggest news out of this week, of course, was the fact that Tenet finally has a digital release date. Uh huh. Tenet! <laughs> What's the original release and how much is it going to cost? The, uh, it's it's coming to Blu-ray and digital uh, December 15th. I think you can pre-order from December 10th. $100 um, for one who ticket writes, for two who pre-orders, hours. Who pre-orders <laughs> yeah. a digital? Like, I guess you just want to what be notified. Yeah, I mean, is anybody <laughs> that excited about Tenet at this point? It's... <laughs> I mean, I do want to see it, but me too. I'm not going to spend 30 bucks or however the fucking much he's going to charge me to watch it by myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! All right, well we hit our tenant quota. Any other stories of the week? That you guys I'm actually a little about? miffed about something. Uh, let's, I'm a little uh, let's miffed about something this Trebek. week. Alex Trebek, I'm I'm really oh Dave, sorry we didn't we did this we did this wrong. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Too, but... Alex Trebek just mm. passed away at the Cheers, age bro. of eighty. I yes, believe. Alex Trebek. This just happened. Cheers to Alex. What is that thing that Jeff? I mean that Dave just said. Yeah. I mean, what, I mean, I'm what little, are you miffed about? Miffed. Bro? Um, I recently discovered uh, the Harry Potter series. Yeah, is nowhere. Um, Correct. Right now, there's nowhere. Yeah, seven paid streaming services, and I can't (laughs) get Harry Potter on any of them. I know, dude. Uh, It's coming up on the holiday season, though, so they usually juice it out somewhere for Christmas time. What the fuck is going on with the streaming services? They're just like handballing it to each other, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's not useful to us anymore. So you can't get it anywhere unless you unless you own the thing. To it's, be fair, Warner Brothers might be charging so much money for them. If that makes so, I, I don't know. It might be it might be Warner's fault. I'm well, assuming I mean, they're in even charge of even HBO Max, which remember. technically should have got is it there back. A third? But there's like a right like a rights dispute somewhere. I'm sure like they haven't got the proper rights. Yeah, but like that should have been that's actually the worst when there's only one. There's like one on Showtime, one on HBO. I, like it's almost oh, the yeah, worst when the they're sprayed out. That is fucking stupid. Especially I've been thinking about this Harry Potter thing because how many people have been sitting home during this pandemic wanting to watch harry potter 500 times and nobody's been able to do it it's so fucking annoying mm. i mean until recent just until just before halloween it was it was on available but uh yeah now right now like peacock it anyway. peacocks it was on peacock and they now that they're open and they don't need it anymore you can't get it anywhere wow it's like Jesus. come on guys like think think of the people think just a little bit just a little bit i'm not asking much <laughs> um well, biden won yeah any other, <laughs> any other, yeah, well, well, Christmas time, I'm sure we'll, Harry Potter will come up, but I'm any sure. other, any other news stories we want to talk about, uh, unless you'll just want to air out any other grievances that you have. Uh, and what is the, no, uh, yeah. I mean, the election <laughs> happened. That's fucking awesome. That's all I thought about this yeah, week. I, that was I, a, I watched, that was a I know, I'm John was, King's best friend. I was, I was actually was in New York thing. City. It was election yesterday. week. We don't have election day anymore. We have election yeah. week. And Dave, yeah. Talk about your experience. I was, I was in yesterday. New York yeah, City Dave, yesterday. Yeah. I was actually, um, when the, the news broke, I was standing in the observatory at One World. Um, I'd never been there before. Must, must admit, this is not a paid endorsement or anything. I just went there the other day for the first time. The mm-hmm. elevators are fucking awesome. It's worth the trip <laughs> just for the elevator up and down. Cause oh, wow. I, I'm not going to tell you what they've done, but oh my God, you'll enjoy it. Um, but the, this thing itself is, is great. It's a, it's and the friendliest staff, like the friendliest attraction staff I've come across in New York city. But anyway, I was standing at the top of one world when that broke and it didn't really hit That's anyone cool. at that point. Like it was kind of like, Oh, okay. And then you got down to the street yeah. and there are people with cars honking. There are people dancing. There are people like, People would honk their cars and the whole, like, half of the village erupted because someone honked their horn. And it was, it was very, like, I wandered through Washington Square Park and there was already a party going on. It was something I'd yeah. never seen before in my life. Wow. That footage was fucking crazy. I'm here in, I'm here in the middle of the mountains and uh, Casey and Sarah stopped by for a couple of days on their way down to Louisiana. So we were hanging out yesterday and, of course, we felt like, oh, I kind of wish we were in one of these big cities. And then in the middle of here, middle of fucking nowhere, in the distance, we could hear people hooting and hollering off, I guess, off their porches and yeah, other parts that of was, the mountain. That was, was New York. You could hear them in North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, seriously, it's, it kind of felt that way. Oh, my god. Jeff, gosh. where are you right now? 
Um, Cape Cod, one more, one more week, probably last week. Cape Cod. Did anybody? Did you hear anybody hooting around, dancing in, in or anything? Provincetown, there was. Provincetown's the tip. Oh yeah. Of the oh, island, yeah. Provincetown was definitely bumping, but nothing around us. We had just gotten home when it happened, which is fine. You know, we got to turn the TV on, which is cool, but just people walking around. It, it's kind of it's it's out of season here. That so. Outside of Provincetown, there was not. I, I went on all the socials and I was like, is there anywhere to go? But I'm hoping everybody now isolates because obviously there was some, you know, anyway. yeah, everybody but be it, safe. It looked, mm. it, lo- it looked, it looked fun. I mean, everyone, and, and everyone I saw had a mask on. So that's yeah, a start. Cool. That's good. Cool, 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 cool. Um, so yeah, that happened. Oscars. I didn't watch any other movies and then the Oscars. Yeah, last thing. Oh, yeah. Dave, yeah. Tell well, us. well I, I was curious about this. So I looked up because uh, uh, I was wondering, like, nothing's come out basically in the cinemas except for Tenet since like may march somewhere there and i was wondering what the oscars nominations would look like this year because we made a joke uh early early on about uh like invisible man and the fact that she might be nominated for a best actress oscar How we won for her yeah, yeah. um You're welcome, but Elizabeth. like literally almost nothing has come out since so i'm just wondering what do you think the oscars are going to look like this year are they going to do it <laughs> are they going to how the fuck are they going to do it I mean, the, that's what I was asking. Do it remotely so before we started, for this start. episode, I, I mentioned this. I was talking to these two. I was like, "How the fuck do?" But how do they even determine what's nominated? Nobody has seen anything. What are they just going to cold call or cold mail or send out a random list of movies that all the Academy members have never heard of before, and tell them to watch all yeah. these movies and vote in the next week? That's just that's absurd. Well, hmm. and of course, ever oh, since yeah. there was, they, it I was mean, ca- it, it's not Festival like we do it first. for a podcast. <laughs> Well, okay. well, like, <laughs> sure. Get off sure. your ass! Stop being it. lazy. Yeah. I remember, like three <laughs> years ago, people got mad at a, at a. I can't remember which one it was, but a Cannes Film Festival entry already had Netflix as a backer. Oh and yeah. And they're like, "Get the fuck out of here!" It's the whole reason we have this festival. Even if you know some things are more just commercial and for show, it is to get distribution. It's to sell the product. It's to mm. it's a partner. That's the whole point of these festivals, or at least it was, and. With the Academy now, if they do the Oscars, I mean, how does Netflix fucking prime? Like, how does Sasha Baron Cohen not all all of a sudden have consideration because it came out on Prime and people saw it? Um, Defy Bloods would be great if it, it was nominated. That yeah. should be nominated for things for sure. That, but that was other thrown movies, about in the article I read. Great, and it, and it should for a bunch of different um, aspects of the film, especially some of those acting performances. Watch out! But a lot of these other Netflix films, like. Is this really the point of the Oscars? Like it used to be the indie films that were fantastic. Mm. Like the the Kiss of the Spider Woman that we talked about, that the actors took scale because they just wanted the movie to be done. And if without the Oscars, we would never be talking about it because it gave them a boost. And now if it's just movies that Netflix paid a hundred million dollars for that everybody got to right. see, yeah, that would be exactly. a bummer. So this and, and they should school. they should we're say just... something by now. But if they cave and if they do the yeah. Oscars and it just is streaming movies that people can access. So it's either going to be movies that people haven't seen, which is just going to turn them off, possibly like lose people for a generation, you know, to the Oscars, or it's going to highlight the very thing that makes the Oscars less relevant. Mm. So tough well, spot for the I Oscars. Don't, I don't know. Uh, is this... I don't know how accurate it was, but the um, the article I read uh, said that the possible rule change could be that if you're if you were scheduled for a cinema run, but had to be cancelled due to COVID, and you went to a streaming service, you still qualified for Best Picture and the other categories. Mm. I could see them doing that. So tell me, guys, because this will be my movie of the year, if this is true. Is Portrait of Lady on Fire in contention for this this Oscars? Ooh, or I don't was know, it because... just ignored completely um, no, last year? The, uh, it was ignored last year. It was ignored last year. They didn't even submit it. They submitted... The, for, you, you, get all, you only get one submission per country, and they submit a different film. Yeah. They submit, they 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 submit like, a new yeah. Les Mis yeah. So Portrait okay. was like the number okay. two. So yeah, it's... it's sorry. No. Yeah. It's crazy. All right. Well, it's going to be weird out. Oscars no matter what, but hopefully we'll get to see some of them, whatever it is. Um, all right, people. Well, a lot of news to talk about, but we got to move on with the pod, of course. So we're going to be talking about seven. 95! We're going to be talking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 1995. <laughs> so 1990 in film, I actually saw two different competing answers with which film was number one. And on the, 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 the number I'm looking at at the box office, they're within $3 million. So it's your favorite Die Hard movie, right? I, I'm looking at Die Hard, yes. Die Hard with a Vengeance. That, yeah. is the, that is the Jeremy Irons one that was always on TV in the 90s. Mm. Um, so Die Hard with a Vengeance, number four, with Samuel Jackson. Uh, $366 million worldwide. And then Toy Story is number two with $363 million worldwide. Crazy. So yeah. they're very close. We've talked a lot about <laughs> Toy Story on our podcast. It is a great <laughs> film. And I think one's the best. Um, Apollo 13, which we'll be talking about shortly, will be number three at $355 million worldwide gross. Goldeneye, get some Pierce Brosnan in there, at number four, 350, mm. 
too. So all these a, movies are very close to Better video other. game than a movie, I think. Mm. Video game is, well, oh my God, all timer. That video game is so good. Pocahontas at number five. Great Disney. Well, I, I don't know how well it aged, but it was fun. And some of the songs are great. You got Batman Forever, another one we're talking about. Then Seven right after that. So all three of our films on the list. Casper the Friendly Ghost and fucking Waterworld. <laughs> and that is a movie that oh, went right yeah. to obscurity. Yeah. And then uh, Jumanji. That is the original Jumanji, of course. Uh, at number 10 these all all these movies are pretty close in in how much money they made moving over to the academy awards just because it's a tent pole for what's going on apparently braveheart was the movie of the year Mm -hmm. so braveheart won best director and best picture we can talk about gibson or not and most quoted yes (laughs) (laughs) and a movie that john has seen many 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 times um other films that came out this year we got babe (laughs) you got the postman Mm -hmm. you've got sense and sensibility Nice film mm-hmm. there. That's a great one. Best actor, Nicolas Cage. I would love to hear from anybody out there that did not know that Nicolas Cage has an Oscar. Or you could go ahead and play the game where you go on Netflix, type in Nicolas Cage, and see how many goddamn movies you've never heard of star <laughs> him and are available on Netflix. Richard Dreyfus, Mr. Holland's Opus in there. You get Anthony Hopkins playing Richard Nixon. <laughs> Dead Man Walking, directed by Tim Robbins, starring Sean Penn. And Oscar winner, Susan Sarandon, who won for her role. Um, you have Casino came out this year. A little Scorsese action going on there. Um, you get Bridges of Madison County, Meryl Streep, Clint Eastwood. Clint. You get Mighty Aphrodite gets Woody Allen another actress's award for an Oscar. He has so many actresses who have won Oscars, and he is such a polarizing figure. It's such a weird thing, but it's just mm. the truth. And then, of course, the upset of the year: Ed Harris for Apollo 13 loses to Kevin Spacey. Not for seven, but for the usual suspects. Um, Pocahontas, this is big because Alan Menken won his seventh and his eighth Oscars in less than 10 years. He has eight Oscars in less than 10 years. If you don't know how Alan Menken is, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, and then Pocahontas with a couple other spatterings, including Enchanted and other things. He makes money. He also wrote Newsies. Anyway, any other movies that you guys want to talk about that I missed out on? Maybe I don't know, when you have to get modular feet. shelves for your Oscars, maybe yeah. it's time to give someone else a fucking go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come Funny. on, Alan. Uh, Heat Heat came out this year, which is a fun... Oh, yeah. Fun crime one, De Niro and Pacino together at last. We've been waiting for that for a long fucking time. Nice. Um, yeah, and that's... There's a Crimson French movie Tide. called La Haine, which is fucking amazing. Oh, yeah. um, it's an incredible movie. Before Sunrise, Linklater. Mm-hmm. First mm-hmm. of the Before Trilogy. That's pretty cool. And uh, that's it. The Net also came out this year. And don't see that movie. <laughs> uh, deal. <laughs> sure. Um, well, guys, what do you say? We get into it. What do you think? Let's do it. Let's do All it. Right, let's talk about Seven. Now, Seven, for anybody watching, this is um, David Fincher. Is it his second feature length film? Can you guys confirm that for me? I think it's number two for him. Uh, he, yeah, David because Fincher... what was his first? Do you know what his first was? It was a failure. It was, it was the from 1993. Third alien movie. Yes, Alien Three. That's it, of course. There is no third um, Alien yeah. movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, exactly. Fincher directed a lot, <laughs> a lot of music videos. So many music videos. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of. And we're talking Madonna. We're talking Iggy Pop. Like huge names. He had directed a lot of um, uh, people. Now, now we know David Fincher for a million different reasons. But um, so anyway, it all starts with seven for him, where his popularity really comes to rise. It's about two detectives, a rookie and a veteran, hunt a serial killer who uses the seven deadly sins as his motive. Those two detectives are Morgan Freeman as the veteran who is retiring in, I believe, seven days from the beginning of the film. He's supposed to be retiring because they keep saying he has six days left. So I want to say he's retiring in seven days. That's Morgan Freeman. And then you have Brad Pitt, who is the rookie who has just moved into town with his pregnant wife, Gwyneth Paltrow, although he does not know that she is pregnant. Um, I will say that, so the, the, the description actually kind of says it all, right? They're trying to figure out who the serial killer is, so it is a crime story. And mm. the two of them are trying to find <laughs> Kevin Spacey. And he is using the seven deadly sins. He's going one at a time. Um, so you've got gluttony, you've got pride, you've got lust, you've got greed, and um, there he's killing, Kevin Spacey is w- killing somebody that um, exemplifies these sins in the most disgusting fashion. The crimes are gruesome. Um, it's a very dark, 
movie. I will say, and I, I imagine you guys can agree with me on this, so I'll definitely take a back seat on this movie, is it's hard to talk about this movie without talking about the filmmaking and the style and the way it's done. This is oh, not yeah. just a who's... So that's why I don't feel bad saying it's Kevin Spacey, because there's so much more than just trying to figure out who it is. You know what I mean? There's just... It's just such an mm. interesting slog, and the way Fincher does it is the movie to me that is a narrative number one but anyway i'll leave it there whoever wants to take it take it away seven i love this movie everybody i assume all of us saw it when it came out and probably have seen this multiple times oh, since yeah. it came out i was uh, one of those, i was a right? small like... child when it came out so i did not see this movie in the <laughs> theater when it came out but it's probably for the best <laughs> although it might explain a lot <laughs> I, I saw, saw pocahontas in theaters out. that's how young i was anyway keep going <laughs> Um, but you're right, man. I feel like this is the, uh, you know, almost miraculously, like I've, I've listened to him talk about his experience, David Fincher's experience making the third alien. And, you know, cause he's kind of, he's very punk. He comes from that, like that mindset, him and his buddies that moved in to LA and, you know, were trying to get things started. They eventually were just like, fuck it. And they just start, they literally just started their own production company and started making commercials. And then they started making music videos. So they kind of made their own way in this weird, And this weird effort to try to get to a place where he could eventually make movies strikes out with Alien 3, although clearly somebody thought he had enough talent Mm. to let him keep making the music videos, which is awesome. I mean, a lot of that stuff is really iconic. And then he comes out with this, and he just lays down the gauntlet for... He is his generation's (laughs) murder mystery director. He is our guy. He does our best murder mystery stuff. Every time he releases one, it's talked about and it's successful. And he's also managed to stay kind of invisible in terms of, I don't think David Fincher is a household name. I think a lot of people in the industry, everyone, we we all know who he is, but I don't think you could say his name anywhere and everyone knows who he is like a Scorsese, even though I would say for his generation, he is as successful as uh, as successful like critically and uh, monetarily as, uh, I don't know, Paul Thomas Anderson or... Maybe not more, Quentin. More, maybe Quentin is a little bit more. But more than Paul, maybe he's probably second, though, behind Quentin Tarantino. He's probably like the next one. And they're, you know, they're all in that same age group. Yeah. He makes like uh, Nolan Soderbergh. Like he's in that film. Oh, yeah, sure. early. Going off, going off immediately. <laughs> um, wait, just, just to say one thing about your point Soderberg, about the way yeah. he comes from the punk world. I wrote down that this looks like a corn or Slipknot music video at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can tell. You can tell how much he fucking he loves that shit, and he is all about. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever heard of that book, uh, "Rebels on the Back Lot," but it's a really cool book about the '90s mm-hmm. indie film gang and how they were kind of coming up and you know making their way. And he loved to push it. Obviously, um, this Fight Club, following it up with the game yeah. and the Fight Club, which is unfucking believable. Um, but this is such a in spite of those things I just said, I, you watch Seven and you realize this basically is his first like real stab at something. Because Alien, you know, it's 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 a sequel. It's not it's not his first take on his own. And I feel like this is an incredibly mature first film. It's it's not a gritty first indie. You can tell that he is obsessed technically with mm. with line and composition. He's he's obsessed with it. Dave, do you agree with me? Like his his lighting oh, and his composition like, are, the, the, are the, the, fucking like perfect. the whole design of this world. Um, it's dirty, it's gritty, it's not neat, and it just contributes to the cinematography perfectly. Uh, there's a fun fact. I'm not sure if it's the version we watched. I'm pretty sure it is because they did a HD restoration straight off the print, uh, and they actually had to go back through and digitally color grade that. So they were able to pull some of the contrast in and like just give it a little bit more, a little bit more shadow and a little bit more intensity in certain scenes. And you can really notice it. So the print that we're mm-hmm. watching today is different to what we saw in cinemas. Wow. It is the contrast mm. is is but he, huge. This but is he, a very he dark went back movie. in and he supervised that whole process. He was like uh, there from top to tail of getting the HD restoration done. So I really I mean, believe it. I mean, yeah. Even when you watch scenes like um even when you watch scenes like uh the first time the two detectives are in the chief's office mm-hmm. and they're still not quite on the same side. And Morgan Freeman is basically saying, don't give him the case. He's too young. He's not ready for this case. And don't give me the case. I'm about to retire. This is going to go on yeah. and on and on. And the way David Fincher, very calmly, and again, maturely, this is not a crazy long one camera movement. This is not elaborate stuff. 
The way he gently walks in from his masters, cutting the room into three parts so that the two older men are consistently on the same side and that Brad Pitt is isolated and then bringing them in through just pretty standard coverage techniques, but the way he edits it all together, this film got nominated for editing. So that's mm -hmm. technically his the first editing. Is, and editing he has side. had multiple films one win for editing. So yeah. it's like, there's almost, I mean, there's, there's a weird juxtaposition that I love to him with the beauty and the aesthetic and the technical ability he has in this very strange way. He likes to, to push subject matter that I feel like is just, it's just his image. It's the cleanest, it's the cleanest looking thing, but it's the dirtiest subject matter out of like all of his cohorts, all the people yeah. in his generation. I mean, it's also, it's not just him bringing that to the party. Like this is a really well-written detective story as well. Like the writing in this yeah. is phenomenal. He manages to yeah. like, there's not a moment when you're not interested in these characters. Like it, it, True. it's what makes the ending so much more powerful. They, they sneakily yeah. sneak in this depth to these characters to make them three dimensional. So you actually care about them and stuff like that. So it's like, there's, just these little bits of exposition through dialogue, which is not that easy to do. If you like, if you got yeah. to get something across, it can come across really contrived. And there's not a single ounce of that in this movie. The acting is so is so strong. Once again, we, I feel like we mm. say this all the time about great movies, and it, it's just so obvious. The acting has to be on point. The director has to let them take their time. You never felt like anyone was delivering lines in this. Like everyone was so grounded, so mm. that. And you, you when know, you get to you know a device why? in the script, like how do we strengthen the relationship between uh, Brad Pitt and his wife, Gwyneth Paltrow, it doesn't feel like a device. Yeah. How do we strengthen the relationship between Gwyneth Paltrow and Morgan Freeman, his partner that he's having friction with? It never feels like a device because the work is so grounded. Yeah, I've referenced this, this a few times. And it's, it's like the thing that, especially when you put like th three, four powerhouse actors in, in a piece and you can see them bouncing off each other, but also you can actually see this character's inner monologue in Brad Pitt's face. Like, his thought process runs across his face. Like, there's times when it's something said that he doesn't like, and you see him not like it. And mm -hmm. it's, it's communicated perfectly in the absolute silence in the two seconds before he speaks. Yeah, and I love the, the, that they... Go ahead. Go, go, go. I was just say the pacing is is incredible. We were talking yeah. about the editing, but there's more to there's more to, to to pacing than just the way that it's cut together. Just the the way that the lines move fast, loud, slow, like that kind of texture is just mm -hmm. really, really complex. And you mix that with the visual imagery, where the, it's very. Dave, you'd be better at this than me. It's so it's raining for the majority of the movie, which is yeah. a, a pretty famous element of this movie. And they, they mention it a couple times. They don't mention, oh, this is a city that always rains. They don't actually mention the name of the city, right? So it's like this strange. But then the everything is inside because of that for the most part. And it's always the same lighting palette, whether it's Morgan Freeman's house or Brad Pitt's house or all the places that they go. It looks yucky. Like it looks nasty. Yeah. And then with adding in the 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 oral texture on top of that but there is beauty in the oral in in that element too especially there's a lot of bach and there's some funk and stuff so i said it's a slipknot movie but it's not the girl with the dragon tattoo where he infused like rock like hard rock it has a softness to it even though it looks morbid and to add to the all the graphic nature of the film the most graphic scenes which there are some very very graphic images are the ones where it's the people so there's the one guy that clearly has gone through trauma because he's basically forced to be a part of a, a, a murderous act. Yeah, I want to talk about that scene in a minute. Yeah, and so that him, and then I was also thinking about um, the lady that has to look at her husband's crime scene because mm -hmm. um, the, for greed. She has to see the scene because they say, like, look, is anything about the office different? Because this guy has been leaving us clues. So this could be helpful. And it turns out that one of the pictures is upside out. Those are the most quote unquote graphic scenes for me, even more so than the other ones, because of the way that it's cut and edited together, where the, the gross stuff is kind of moved very quickly. So it's not like it's not trying to yuck me. And I think that's brilliant. I think yeah. it's brilliant. I think the, the mark of a good yeah. uh, director in this case, uh, in what his, what his style is, in particular with the last kill that you were talking about, where the guy has a like a device put on him and he's, he's made to participate that in device, man. the killing. Holy shit. Um, the reason that scene is so horrific is because of what they don't show you. Because they you come in and you right. literally see the prostitute's legs. And you see her upper torso and you're like, okay, she's dead. Something's been done to her. And there's this guy screaming, right. get this off me, get it off me, get it off me. And then you don't know what's happened. And it cuts to the interrogation room and they throw down a photo of him wearing the device and they show what it actually is. 
And yeah. at that moment, you're like, holy fuck, and your mind fills in the blanks. Exactly. So that yeah. scene, be- yeah. so the the creation of that scene by not showing you becomes personal to the watcher because you've yeah. created because the missing be- pieces. And it's not something you can look away to. You can't just like, oh, I don't want to look at this and close your eyes because now this it's like it's, it's a part of head. you because yeah. it's your imagination. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Pr- it's fucking brilliant. That's this movie's incredible. Yeah, it really is. That uh, yeah, I was trying to be careful when I was saying that earlier. He's his subject matter, not the way he executes. I don't feel like anything he does is gratuitous. Nothing mm. is about is based on gore. Oh, He's no, good no. at getting you inside the mind of people who are trying to think like serial killers. Sometimes he gets you close to the serial killers too. But this one, Zodiac, Mind Hunter, um, even he love he loves psychopaths. I love Mind Hunter. Fuck you, Mark Zuckerberg. Like he gets so social social Mind network Hunter. too. He's good at doing that. And Jeff, I love how you pointed that out because it it just got me thinking about uh, aesthetically with visual tone and 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 sound as well. He loves creating contradictions. Like you, you mentioned, uh, Dragon Tattoo. Why isn't it important that he shoves rock music down your throat? Because it's set in a beautiful billionaire's right. estate, right? Why is Social Network not like doesn't sound like music of the time in two thousand eight? Because Trent Reznor's haunting score. Mm-hmm. Had to contradict the fact that this beautiful positive thing that's bringing everybody together is actually ruining lives while yes, it's being it's, created. It's not your grandma's. Um, it's not your grandma's college story. Was the pitch for that <laughs> score? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's he's a he's brilliant at. I can't remember who wrote the music for this one. I feel like I, I knew the person who wrote the music for this I'll one. Look it but, up. Um, it's uh, it's just it's just telling that he's again. It's that maturity thing. Like it's uh, I think a lesser, maybe more rambunctious director that only had that punk influence that he's so proud of. Oh, it's Howard Shore. Would, Holy shit. It's Howard Shore. That's what I thought. Dude. Would be would be a lot more uh, abrasive with all of their stuff. But he lets you come to it, which is the yeah. beauty of this whole thing is that you become, um, God damn it, what's Morgan Freeman's character's name? It's such a good Somerset. name. <laughs> Somerset. Somerset, right? Like you might not ever feel like you're Brad Pitt, which is fine, but you start to think about murder and serial killing the way Somerset does, which for me... <laughs> is as uncomfortable as what they learn about what Kevin Spacey does. The Somerset mm. is trapped in this world with that fucking metronome trying to help him sleep. He's trapped in this city that you never see. You never see the city. And all he wants just, is it's out. It's raining all the time. It's, <laughs> and all he wants is out, and he can't get out because it's too late. He is stuck there. Mm-hmm. And I feel like uh, it's a beautiful scene, but it's kind of perfect for what I'm talking about. When he goes to the library, and they put on the box, yeah. and he's walking around, he's doing his research, I remember when I was a kid and I saw this, I remember thinking like, oh, it's a beautiful, like cinematic moment. Like, I've, like this is so rich. The library is so beautiful visually and the sound is so nice. And now that I'm an adult, whenever I watch this movie, that creeps me out maybe more than any other scene in this movie because that is what that man's day to day is. He goes at the, at the end of the day, he goes to the library and looks up shit about somebody who's murdering someone the next day. Mm-hmm. He's trying with, to get in yeah, their head Bach and figure the out what they're going to do next yeah. with this beautiful thing in the background. I don't know. I just actually really, really I love incredible. That- I actually love to to that point, to spe- specifically about Morgan Freeman. The buddy cop trope is going on forever. Mine Hunter has its own buddy tr- buddy cop tropes. There's something about this where Brad Pitt is convinced it's a psychopath, as I'm sure most of the audience is. Like this is a freak. He's a nut job. I think they made a reference that he's probably wearing his grandma's underwear, or whatever. Which I I kind of feel like is aware that Silence of the Lambs has already happened. You know what I mean? So it's like, that's who you expect yeah. a killer to be. And Morgan Freeman is so calm. And he's like, this person has more purpose. This yeah. person has more. Like, yeah, they're a freak. But like, they have, there is a rational way of thinking. It's just not normal. It's not a, it's not a regular way of thinking. But it is traceable. It is, you can go from point A to B to C of Kevin Spacey's character's arc and you can figure that out and morgan freeman is curious about that not in an enlightened way but in a we need to figure this out so that we can stop it but it does exist kind of way and i think that is really interesting for us and i mean fincher is better than that look at fight club right there's the same Mm -hmm. person but they're two different characters um the social network between zuckerberg and then um and savarin um you're talking you're talking house of cards if you just want to talk about Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright Penn, maybe like he's really, really good at that dichotomy of the two main characters. Yeah. yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal mm-hmm. and the other two in Zodiac, yeah. uh, Mark Ruffalo and RDJ. Like it's, and let's talk, let's, so let's go there with, with Spacey. So like you wait till, you know, two thirds of the movie before you finally ever see him. And then it's the last quarter of the That's movie when he finally reveals true. himself. I mean, well, you yeah. see him, you see him before, right? You don't know <laughs> you it's see, him. Yeah, but know, but like, they, it's... they hide, they hide his character in, 
tons of scenes before, like at least two that I know of. Like he's a photographer in the stairwell. Right. Um, and and then, that's a noir thing, right? That's a noir thing. The but he's, he's also um, in the, the leather store when the, the answering shot where they're showing the window, he's outside the window. Uh, as he mentions right. the guy yeah, had a, as he mentions the guy had a limp, he walks off with a limp. It's like right. it's there's just all these little inserts. I don't know have whether there's probably more, but also that's the mark of someone who's not only good at their job but enjoying their job because they just leave these little things for you to find on the second watch wow. or the third watch because they're like that is really good. yeah. It's I'm not I'm not going to tell you this. You're going to find it and you're going to feel great because you found it. I like that in a film. And at the end. I mean, of course, yeah, mm. I, w- I want the nuggets and it's good for a rewatch, but it's also even just learning about that. You don't have to go rewatch it. That's going to creep you out just knowing that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it works. You know, it works when you finally have seen everything that this horrible man has done. And Fincher does kind of what we're saying. Uh, he did, you know, he didn't write the script, but like the way he, the way they play it out, the way it's captured and Kevin Spacey is so good that even after everything that's happened, his final monologue, about how they're not innocent. That should make you think about how you feel yeah. about whether they're innocent. If you were completely on Brad Pitt's side, this movie has not worked for you. If you were sitting there and you're with Morgan Freeman and you're just watching him talk and listening to his reasoning, you don't have to agree with it, but you understand that this man does have purpose. And I love that right after that. Isn't it right after his monologue about you tell me they're not, they're not uh, guilty? Morgan immediately wraps it up with like, does that mean you're doing the Lord's good work? Hmm. Like he immediately just brings it back to him to try to yeah. contradict his that, that you weren't chosen for this, and immediately comes back to just the idea of trying to to solve something. So I feel like the reason this movie works for me so much is that it's not just a murder mystery like Silence of the Lambs and the other great ones. I am trying to solve something up until what's in the box. Yeah. Like it, it never what's stops the until the, and, and the again, mystery uh, keeps growing. Funnily enough, you and mentioned the Fight Club stops. earlier. That this and Fight Club again, two of the most quoted films ever. Yeah, what's yeah. in the box? Yeah. I think I think Brad Pitt was asked like what I think we, we him and DiCaprio did a joint a lot of joint pressers for um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and they said, "Hey, Brad Pitt, what's the line? Is it something Fight Club?" And he's like, "It's what's in the box, man." People on the street just fucking shout it to him like all yeah. the time. It's what's in the box, <laughs> of course. Um, Especially course, you know, if you just picked up a cake, you're carrying it at home. It's like what's right. in the box? All right, you got me. You got Dave, me. Did you, you said it earlier, but Dave, you, Dave, you said it earlier. This whole fucking movie climaxes with something that you don't know. You, I mean, you don't see. Yeah. You know yeah. it's in the box. Mm-hmm. Right? It, yes. We don't want to see that severed head that has nothing yeah. to fucking do you with fill it. In the blanks more yourself. terrifying knowing it's not there. I, 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 put down, mm. I took down more notes, but the, I'm just throwing about the window. It doesn't matter. The framing is perfect. The filming is perfect. The, the, the lines, as you mentioned. I had one about... Kevin Spacey in the backseat of the cop car and the way they framed that mm-hmm. is so interesting. Yeah. Um, I think I think the oh, biggest so endorsement of the film. I mean, honestly, we we could spend the whole episode talking about this film, but I think the biggest endorsement is we're not actually talking about the crimes. And that's how you know this is a fucking awesome crime story. Because yeah. if, if we just want to sit here and talk about how the killer did it and, and how they're finding the evidence and all that kind of shit, okay, then then great. But but we're not talking about that. And I think that's that's a huge endorsement of the film. Because again, there are We're the seven deadly about, sins. Yeah. What does that mean? Exactly. I could tell you, but it's a waste of our goddamn time. That's not what the movie's about. And also they, so, they made it at least so halfway through. They made it at least halfway through. During this rewatch. Go. You go. Say that again. Sorry. You I cut you. You cut out. <laughs> okay. Okay. We had a zoom thing uh, there, people. I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> that was a yeah, give us get, get, bear with us. I was this time I was watching it, so I, I feel like this is probably my seventh or eighth time seeing this movie. And I that's exactly what I started thinking about, Jeff. I was like, what the fuck? It's impo- I, I'm convinced now. It is nearly impossible. I'm sure there are brilliant exceptions to this rule, but movies of all genre only really work and transcend whatever their genre is and whatever their plot is when human being relationships are, are really at the core of it. So that if this movie was just a kick-ass story, we would not be having this conversation. I don't think that's why people go back to it over and over and over again. The acting is great. The script is well written and it develops these characters so that within these ridiculous, crazy circumstances of this Sedley Devon Sins character who is, you know, bringing all these people together, you have drama at the center of it. There is human drama. You were really upset at the end because if you were Brad Pitt, you would blow his fucking head off, too, Mm -hmm. because you got so close to Gwyneth Paltrow through both their eyes. So that's just, I don't know. I just couldn't stop thinking about it this time. I'm so glad you reminded me of that human relationships, baby. And that's what he nails. And it's it's also straight away you know that Morgan as soon as you see Morgan Freeman's face he's like yeah this is happening 
It's like there's there's nothing Nightmare. I can do to stop this. He's he's trying to dis he's trying to disarm the situation before it even happens, and then it just gets to the point. He's like, ah, oh, fuck. All right, yeah, we're going there. And uh, that line when he says, "Back away," he has the upper hand. He's yelling at the helicopters. Yeah. He's, he's like, he's got the upper hand. Get out of here. Get out of here. He immediately, just the terror. Sorry. Keep mm. going. Yeah, but I, I do I, I do congratulate the director for making it at least two thirds of the way through the film before he made Morgan Freeman read something. <laughs> <laughs> Which was Kevin Spacey's notes because Kevin yeah. Spacey's character Which, did not again, handle quarantine well. He did yeah. not handle quarantine well. He just wrote and wrote and wrote. Yeah, they had those actually produced. Like <gasps> oh they were God, they the were journals. written yes, as well. Yes, they yes. cost like fifteen thousand dollars or something. Oh my god. All those fucking little journals yeah. that that he filled in. I believe it, dude. Yep. Well, anyway, man, Look, that was we, a fun rewatch. Yeah. Give it a shot. I don't know last time you folks checked it out, but this is a this is a once a year movie for me. It just does not get old. I really mm. just. And I, it I really is available it on HBO time. Max. Yeah. HBO yeah, Max. And of course, I have a Roku, cool. so that makes my life a fucking nightmare. But eventually they're going to settle their disputes, just like American democracy. And with that, people, <laughs> we are going to move on. We are going to take a little break. It's quicker so we than can, that. Um, so we can stock up again. We're gonna we're gonna film this next part, and we're gonna re- we're gonna release it. So if for whatever reason you'd rather see what we look like or you want to share this with your friends, we are gonna be going back on Facebook Live for our Apollo 13 segment, and then I guess again in our Batman Forever segment. But stick around, folks. Apollo 13 coming at you in a minute. See you soon. We're back. We're back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ladies, gents, and those who have yet to make up their minds, we have just finished our seven segment. That is seven. David Fincher seven, mm. starring Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt and Gwyneth Paltrow and Kevin Spacey. We are now moving on to Apollo 13. We are talking about films from 1995. We discuss which films we should choose. And we chose Apollo 13, a film... I would imagine many people out there have seen. It is, Just as I said at the beginning <laughs> of this podcast, but for those of our in our live or our video viewers, it is definitely a film that comes up a lot if you ever play Six Degrees of Separation from Kevin Bacon, since he is in this film, along with Tom <laughs> Hanks, Gary Sinise, Bill uh, Paxton. What a list. Yeah. Ed, Harris. Ed Harris. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's probably somebody else I'm missing out on. This is a fantastic film. Um, this is a great story. It's a fantastic story. It has one of my brother's favorite lines in a movie of all time. Um, what Apollo line 13, is that? Ron Howard. <laughs> guess, guess, guess what it is. We just lost the moon. Uh, oh no! Get the fuck out of here, you guys. <laughs> yeah. Houston, no. Yeah, with all due with all due respect, sir, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. Come okay, on. Okay, I posted okay. that this week on our yes. handle because. Of the election that was happening this week, but we don't, we already talked about that in our podcast, so we're going to move on. Apollo thirteen. This is the story of the Apollo thirteen astronauts. Just to remind everybody, Apollo eleven was the first mission to the moon that was successful. That was Buzz Aldrin and I forget the other guy. Oh yeah, Neil Armstrong. That's right, the two of them, and then the third <laughs> guy, and then the third guy flew the spacecraft. Neil Armstrong just then? No, uh, <laughs> although it was a callback to <laughs> High School High, where they call him Louis Armstrong's brother Neil. <laughs> Um, no, this is <laughs> Apollo 13. So this is like very, very early 1970s. And we, I think we know the story. Houston, we have a problem. Except for one viewer who went to the cetera, test cetera, screening cetera. and filled out um, their I'll thing. go ahead. They filled, they filled out their uh, I response saw this card. In... That, and it was like, the ending is completely unbelievable. There's no way they would have yeah, survived. Because they, yeah. they say they're dead at three minutes and then they're out there for five minutes. They did fuck us over a little bit. But I will say, having seen this in the theater when I was a child, and I asked so many questions. My poor mom got destroyed by me asking so many questions about what was going on. And my mom's like, I don't know. I don't work at NASA. Watch the movie. Anyway, I remember this very, 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 very well. I will say this is a time in American history, right after the 1960s, right, where it it, it tends to be generally white and male so this might not be the most culturally responsive choice of us to do in the year 2020 but this is it's a true story now we now know thanks to movies like hidden figures and thanks to just history that there were other people being rep there were other um 
people who are uh, other representations that are not in the Ron Howard film, which is from 1995, and the the time 1970. I, I, I don't know. Like the Hidden Figures ladies were specifically for the John Glenn going into outer space. I don't know how many people working at NASA were were non white, non male. This movie is very much white and male. This movie would not do well with the current Academy Awards um, certifications oh, that yeah. you need. <laughs> it would not do well, if we're being honest. No. So is it historically accurate? Possibly. I, 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 I imagine it's at least very close. But I think it's okay for us to talk about this film, but also be aware that it, it does make this American success story. It do, People may not see themselves in this story, and that may you know distance future Americans. Maybe 20 years from now, people watching this podcast wondering why we're talking about this movie. It's a, Yes, this happened. It's real. Mm. It didn't represent all of what America is great about, but it was a great thing that happened in America. So we're talking about it. Apollo 13. I think we know the, spe- the, the pitch. They're going yeah. back to the moon to get more moon rocks, bring them back, do the research. Tom Hanks is in charge. Out there, there is a, an explosion that leads to the oxygen um, it basically evaporating and then in basically the size of this closet three men have to go from the moon back to home um it, with a little bit of power enough to power a vacuum and they somehow make it back it's a great story that's apollo 13 mm. directed by ron howard who wants to take it from there i think you got it man i think we're good yeah <laughs> okay right. thanks. Nice thanks for thank joining you us. so yeah, much for that? everybody <laughs> viewing in <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Dave? I feel like you're about to say something. Oh, no, I was just, uh, we've got comments popping up. Uh, Peter's just Already? said the new Academy guidelines are ridiculous. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so, some, some are. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll, it's let's a just, good idea. It's a good idea. I'll put it's it a that step way. In the right Having direction. said that, yeah, yeah. Having said that like part, it. part of these guidelines are because Green Book won Best Picture and pissed people off. Green, Bur- Green Book passes all these guidelines. So it's like, it's, it's a very strange thing. Schindler's List would not. What do we do with that? I, I don't know. But, but, but at least the Academy's trying. I just don't know if they needed to make a, a law. Well, it's important to bring it up. It's important to bring it up culturally. That, so Jeff bringing this up and us having this conversation right now is reflective of what was happening in the 60s at this point. There's that wonderful um, you know, spoken word thing of Wadi on the moon. You know, there was that big, it was a popular part of the protest that was happening at that point with the Vietnam War, pulling out yeah. of the Vietnam War and the Apollo missions is that all these conversations about civil rights have been happening. And we had this space race going on, which mostly featured white, you know, white people in the civil service and NASA that were leading this program, headed by people we got through Operation Paperclip, which are mostly ex-German scientists who obviously were white. So, I mean, it's not, I don't, I don't feel bad about it. It just, it is what it is. That's what it looked like at the time. They made a movie about it and it's actually very mm. accurate. So I'm, I'm going to segue using that. Ron Howard talks about this movie a lot um, stylistically. That's a good segue. Because he, he, thank you. Him <laughs> and Tom Hanks, him and Tom Hanks talked quite a bit ahead of time about why they wanted to make this movie. And uh, anyone who knows Tom Hanks knows that man fucking loves the generation yeah. that came before. World War II and the moon. It, He's like, fuck yeah. <laughs> He fucking loves it, dude. His childhood rocked his fucking world. So anyway, they talked a lot about how they wanted to shoot this movie. Obviously, NASA has a lot of wonderful stock footage. They have cameras everywhere, and they took so much footage in their mission control offices, in the buildings, in the laboratories, on the space, uh, all all the space flight, uh, the the tests, simulations, and Mm. the actual launches themselves. So there are cameras fucking everywhere. They're geniuses, and they're like, someday Ron Howard is going to want to make a movie of this. He's going to need reference (laughs) material. Somebody's always going to make it. Um, So as they're doing this, and he's sitting there researching, and he's watching this stuff, he came to this realization that whenever he would come upon an issue, because Ron Howard is a planner, like like a lot of other directors, you know, he, he will make adjustments as he needs, but he likes to plan ahead. He likes to have a shot list and storyboard. He likes to know what they're going to be doing on the day. And he said, every time I would come up on an issue when we were planning anything, every single detail of production design and filming, every single time I would come up on an issue where I would say, how do I do this? I would remind myself, Ron, just show it. Just show it. The story is good enough. Mm. Almost, it doesn't feel like, you know, handheld, gritty video camera documentary style. But you can tell he's not doing anything that he doesn't need to do. That's just how gripping the space race fucking is. I mean, you can look at something like the launch sequence, which is iconic now. 
and James Horner's score behind it just elevates it to this other amazing thing. And yet, there's like 30 different camera angles. It's just the event that's happening is a fucking rocket launch into space. <laughs> like, yeah. all you have to do is just show that. Just show yeah. the men inside, show the people watching, show them crying, show the rocket lift off. Don't do anything you don't need to do. The story is incredible enough. So, and, I don't know, I feel like it's a good lesson. Sometimes space movies get way out of hand with trying to show how kick-ass it is that they're in space and not focusing on the fact that human at the core of this story is Tom Hanks sitting there next to his wife after Neil Armstrong and Buzz land on the moon. And he's after the party, and they're sitting there at the beginning, and he says, tonight we just landed two uh, astronauts on the moon. And you know why? Because we chose to do that, or because we decided to. That's it. We decide. So I feel like... That is at the core of this the entire time. These are just humans. So we can say what we want about the civil rights issues around it. But those are human beings on planet Earth that made a choice to prioritize technology and science for a very specific purpose. And it yeah. led to a great story in 1995. That's a, Hopefully, that's hopefully we continue to include other people, other representations in the future. Challenger did not make that easy. Now, of course, that was too late anyway, because that was in the 80s. But that, that was it. It was done. So... It's it's fucking sucks. I want to call out our friends in the chat right now. We got Chris Hazard in the fucking chat. Chris Hazard, man. How are you? It's so Chris good to Hazard. see you. What's it's up, so dude? good to see you. Chris oh Hazard said God, he just left the U.S. Rocket and Space Center in Huntsville three hours ago. Chris Hazard, this podcast is for you. Fuck. And of course, yes, we have dude. Peter McLean. Anybody who wants any real estate services in New York. I hear the market is a buyers and renters market right now. Let me get it right. What is it? Real, real estate daddy? What does he call himself? Real I'm looking you up, Peter. We'll I'm going to shout you anyway, out. Anyway, we got to stay on track. Dave hasn't talked yet i'm I'm happy to get into apollo 13 i, I, I mean i just i just want to say the, the moon landing is still a damn fine source of inspiration if you want to be inspired like yeah and they, they kick off the movie with that it's and it, he straight away he's like i want to go back there yeah and it's like yeah fucking so do i like it's it's awesome and it, like also just while we're on the moon landing thing a couple of quick things about the times if you want to hear one of the great untold stories or almost untold stories of that particular moment when they were broadcasting. Have a look at the Australian film The Dish. They they comedy comedy it up a little bit, but they're actually the guys who ran the satellite dish. Yes. Uh, in yes. Australia, in the in the middle of a sheep station, uh, that ha- that handled the broadcast. Yeah. And uh, I knew that detail. That's fucking also, awesome. Also, I I did take the liberty of looking up uh, a, a the um Apollo Eleven computer, the computers they had on board. Uh, it had a processor that ran at 0. 0.043 megahertz what right yes the make iphone point, runs point, at 2,490 megahertz and that's probably not even the so, new one like they, so they went whenever- yeah, they, they went to they went to space with the equivalent of like my tv remote control barely yeah, yeah. yes exactly barely so they're basically every time they're touching one of those there's things like there is a code that's in this computer, but it's basically they still have to, through analog processes, make every single procedure happen by hand. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, and once again, this is just. Again, I don't want to I don't want to get convoluted with the race stuff because I we, we are trying to figure that out. And I'm I'm not saying that we have figured we it out by Spoiler. any means. This is, but I hope we can talk about yeah. this as something different. Of course, I hope we can talk about this as something different. This is. This is people who did have the means, clearly, in a government that had the means that prioritized the, all the resources to take a risk to try to do something that hadn't been done before. And the amount of technology that has come out of the research on how to build these fucking rockets and how to go to the moon, we wouldn't have uh, so many things. And now we're at a place where I think we have to tie it back. SpaceX had its, you know, its first like really successful launch this past year. And I think we're kind of coming back into a time where I always thought it was interesting that we had the space race in the 60s, where it was this time of civil unrest and social issues. Kind of sounds familiar right now. So I feel like what a wonderful way to get us back to being excited about science and technology than space exploration. Um, so I hope that kind of helps lead the charge, not just pandemic fighting about what, what we should and shouldn't do, but like, this is kick-ass science. Yeah. Fuck yeah. you if this isn't inspirational as shit. I mean, I, I look forward to how, like, if, if I do, hopefully in my lifetime we have the Mars landing moment. But we are getting I'll off track. Let's talk about the film. Let's talk about the film. We're meant to be talking about the film. We're talking about what preceded the film. Um, I And also I would love to see one of these launches for real one day because I've never seen a rocket launch. Um, and I've always wanted to see it since I was a little kid. I, okay, so I was Jeff, flying from Fort Myers, Florida to Chicago. 
I always choose a window seat. So I was on the right hand side. If you can picture Fort Myers is on the bay side and I, we're in the, we just lifted off. It's the middle of the day. And the person comes on the, the host, the stewardess comes on the loudspeaker and says, Hey, uh, anybody who's sitting on the right side of the plane, the uh, spatial launch at Cape Canaveral, Florida is going to be taking off any second now. And I was like, I literally was in a window seat. So I looked <laughs> and I could see it. Honestly, what it looked like is a red bullet. It looked very small and it was 100% red. And I, I literally just all of a sudden out of nowhere, just saw this little red thing. Mm. And then like 15 seconds later, it was gone. Good that, that it. it looked small because if it, if it if it meant if it looked any bigger, you were but too yeah, fucking I, close. But yeah, I, I I very strangely <laughs> saw a rocket launch from from space. That's yeah, how said. fucking lucky was I? <laughs> okay, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean the one that getting back to the film, which we keep having trouble. Yeah, what are we talking about? <laughs> this, this, I mean this. The one thing I really dug about this film, like on a rewatch, because I wasn't sure if it would hold up uh, on a rewatch, because uh, I enjoyed it the first time, but it it really does a great job of making you forget that you already know how this ends. Yeah. Like it's a historical piece. We know how this work came out, but they do a fantastic job. Like the drama still feels real. Yeah. And I, and why? Like, who knew you could create so much <laughs> right. tension watching well, a fucking you know what's end funny? I imagine this. And um, I know Tom Hanks did a lot of movies in the nineties, but this and saving Pepper Ryan, I'm sure Tom Hanks was like, we need miniseries. I don't have, the, I don't, we don't have enough time. Cause that's what I was thinking about. The first 25 minutes of this also, I was watching with Chloe and I was like, it's about space in the first 20, 30 minutes. When you're watching at home, when there's other distractions around, sometimes it takes a second because those scenes fly. There are like two line scenes that have mm. to say huge amounts. They threw exposition in any line. It's like, oh, man, I, I guess I'm not going to see you at 12 a.m. tomorrow in the South China Sea. It's like they, they try to give you the information as, <laughs> as seamlessly as possible. Um but 30 minutes into this movie is blast off, but he's not even on the mission when the movie starts. So it goes from it, like so much has to happen in 30 minutes. But once you get to space, it is it is incredible because I was actually I actually took a note and, and we can ask the question. Sorry, I just look at my note and it said I could eat the ass out of a dead rhinoceros. I don't remember that line when I was younger, but somebody was like, <laughs> Bill Paxton is like, Bill I could Paxton. eat the ass out of a dead rhinoceros. And I was like, I don't remember that. It's after he throws yeah, yeah, up yeah. when and he's like, sick in fuck? space. Is it is it a statement to your character that that's the first place your eyes went? Let's let's look at this in terms of status. I love that. It's a very Trumpian line. Anyway, I said uh, Ed Harris. It's a very Duval performance. I'm getting all over the fucking place. There's so much to talk about. Dude, this. if I'm if I'm ever in what trouble, I want Ed Harris on my rescue team. Ed Harris oh is on my God. rescue team if I'm ever in trouble. All right, Billy people, right, people one at a time. People one at a time. Oh, he's so 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 good. Anyway, anyway. Ed Harris laughing when Tom Hanks takes off his biomed sensors is like how fucking it's oh my god it's so so great no that's not what I'm talking about my point is this movie fucking oh flies god. until it's in space because it knows that once you're there you're hooked even the slow parts in space at the beginning when it's just like the video the the, the film and all that kind of stuff but when the shit starts to happen and when it starts to compress they do such an amazing job of even it's cinematic it's meant for the big screen it's not meant for the small screen they're in a box for the majority of this mm. and they are they don't have power on they are floating in space towards the earth with no power on and it is so gripping the, the way that they film it so even though i actually my, my note that i wrote down which i'm curious about is do the special effects do the visual effects hold up because sometimes in the launch which is brilliant sometimes it's you know, there's, it's a little clunky, maybe. It's not a hundred. It's not as seamless as it would be if it was completely done by computers. But at the same time, it has this realistic, weird thing where you don't know what's going to happen at any minute. I, 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 don't, I don't know the, the answer to mm. that. I but I know that good. I was gripped, especially once they got to space. I mean, I, the, thing I, the thing I love the most is when they get to space, the, aside from, you know, what happens outside, the special effects stop because yeah. those weightless sequences were actually shot on the infamous on the vomit, vomit comet. comet. Right? Yeah. yeah, and apparently none of them threw up. So yeah, great. You can you can um, kind of tell too. This stuff's kind of fun. I mean, once again, okay. yeah. But they had they had they had to do six hundred and twelve dives to get that yeah. footage. How many? Six hundred and twelve dives. Holy yeah. dog shit! So <laughs> it's like yeah, each because each dive is like twenty four seconds. So you only get twenty four seconds of filming. That's why it's the Stupid. cuts are so quick up there. Yeah, just cheat that shit. Yeah, I mean, whatever. They did it. They went for it. So everything you guys are saying, I feel like is uh it kind of ties into what I was saying about seven and contradicts a little bit of this is the magic of this movie of what I was saying at the beginning of this about just show it, Ron, just show it. Whenever he was trying to yeah. think of the most simple way, just point the camera at these actors. Okay. Well, what are you pointing it at actors? What this, 
the meta thing about what this story does that is so beautiful is that anyone who was alive at that time talks about it this way. Anyone who was not alive yet, like like us, watching moon landing footage or the first space shuttle launch or when Sputnik was in space, how unifying it is. It reminds us that like humans do this stuff. This movie takes you behind the scenes and and shows you the the human drama. At the end of the day, this came down to three people who put their life on the line. Yeah, there were millions of uh, millions and millions of dollars put behind it, and there were committees that made all these decisions. But when it really came down to it, there were three humans that were up there. And a group of humans had to figure out how to save those humans. Drama ensues. If he had not built the relationships with between Tom and his wife, um, holding off on de- on developing the relationships with everybody that's in right behind me, Mission Control, until shit hits the fan, oh, and then yeah. their drama ensues, and they have to work together better. The way he changes his camera coverage when he introduces Mission Control versus after the accident happens. He starts moving in close. The camera moves a whole lot more, going in and out of close-ups, going uh, trying to show who these people actually are. That's why this movie actually works, because... I've seen really good documentaries about Apollo 13. John, with the double gush on this episode. (laughs) Sure. I've seen good documentaries on Apollo 13. Uh, For anyone who's interested, actually, all these people, uh, there's a Mission Control documentary that's really cool, and they mostly talk about Apollo 13 because it was their biggest triumph, right? Mm. It was their biggest obstacle, biggest triumph. Um, But the reason this movie is not a documentary and not shot in a documentary form and why it's such a cinematic event is because he brought those people to the forefront. So this is a director, just storytelling wise, I love it. Because he realized I've got a wonderful story on my hand. I don't need to do very much. All I have to do is bring out the humanity. Show these people struggling to save these three men and how badly these three men want to get back to their families and want to get back to our home, Earth. So it's just just really simple and it's so effective. This is how rewatchable is this movie? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I found it me? extremely rewatchable. I also love <laughs> yeah. that they don't just focus on the guys up there. It's, it's the genius of Mission Control, where all these guys get thrown into a room, they're fighting, and suddenly someone goes, all right, you have this stuff, and you've got to make this. And, like, that, even that scene's been parodied on, like, Big Bang Theory and a couple of other shows as well. It's And it's just to, again, I love the fact that, like, these guys are able to work together to overcome this, and, like, they're fucking geniuses. It's such a mild uh, the the, Another thing you were talking about without the, uh, when Tom Hanks is like, guys, I'm getting a little swirly up here, I need you to check my math. And mm. like a line of ten of them just whip out their pad and paper right. and their yeah, doing their head. Let's go. And they're like, fuck it all. I'm doing it by head, right? Like they did this in the sick. They were no, what the fuck? And also, How did they, they didn't do this need an then? order. They didn't need Ed Harris to say do this. They just fucking got their pad out and they did it and they gave the thumbs up. But Ed Harris led by example. That was like this is true. Like me growing up and stuff. This is true leadership. Watching Ed Harris, he gets entered late in the film. It's a great. I mm. mean, it's like it, almost almost laughable now if you've seen the movie ten times. The way they're like, oh, Gene's gonna like that. Oh, this is for Gene. This is Gene. And of course, it's Ed Harris. But when he comes in and he takes over, Miss, it, it is it is. Um, you guys, stunning. you guys, he's still alive. That guy. He's yeah. he is that guy. Ed Harris fucking nailed it. That man oh is still God. alive, and he is like the captain. Jeff, it's like the end of Band of Brothers when they finally show you the Fuck captain. Yeah. And you're yeah, like, get yeah. the fuck out of here. Of course, I would follow that man into hell. I mean, that, yeah, exactly. this guy is the actual just guy like is in the film somewhere <laughs> as well. In the background. Oh, sweet, yeah. dude. Sweet, sweet. <laughs> That's um, really cool. I would say... All right, it, so let which, me ask you... Oh, the last thing I'll say Kevin is Spacey, the, really? the most touching line for me in this rewatch, though, is, is of course, they're going to the moon. None of them have ever had ever been there. And they circle the moon to come back. They use the moon's gravity to swing them back. How fucking brilliant is that? I, I can't imagine doing the calculus behind that. But they all look at the moon. They all pick Tom Hanks has the image where he pictures himself on the moon holding the rocks. But then you see when they find the landing spot. Kevin Bacon mm. and and Bill Paxton go, that's where we were going to land. And they're staring at it. And Tom Hanks is trying to move on. And he goes, guys, I just, I just want to go home. And here he is. His whole mm-hmm. life's mission was to get to the moon. Mm. And he gets homesick right when he's at the moon. And I think that's really cool. Anybody who's ever gone anywhere. Oh, I just want to go to college. And you go to college. You go, I miss home. Oh, I've always wanted to go to, to Europe. And you go to Europe and you're like, I can't wait to get home. Yeah, dude. It's like, I miss my wife. I want to yeah. go. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. What were you saying, John? It's just so touching. I just wanted to ask you all now that we because we mentioned it in the last time. Do you think Ed Harris should have won over Kevin Spacey in uh, Usual Suspects? Do you think this was a better role? I, th- I understand why Kevin I mean, Spacey won. I, I mean, feel like is it, did Kevin Spacey win because iconic. of the like the twist and the fact that you no, were he won like, for a usual un- oh um yeah but like the twist in Unusual Suspects yes. like and his impediment and, his yeah, you know his and, physical 
yeah, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. The, the, I mean, I'm sure it was a close call. Because yeah, it was a hotly, yeah, like it probably, said, it probably I, took about five Harris days or so for it to movie. finally count all the votes until he finally decided. <laughs> Um, if I how good is Gary Sinise in this movie? Gary oh, Sinise's yeah. re-entrance to Mission Control when they need him to run the system from their like rehearsal pod, if you will, and then he yep. has to go to Mission Control and relay the information. When he re-enters and he's drunk and he's in a bad mood or whatever, he's tired, and he re-enters it and he is just like so fucking game faced. He's so focused again to all the actors out there, the directors that we talk about this all the time that want the drama that you want the big moments and stuff. He comes in, Ed Harris does this the whole movie. Give me this, give me that, give me that. Don't give me that. They don't have that. I want this, yada. And they just move. And you don't worry about being dramatic. Yeah, you just do the thing. And it was, oh, it's mm. awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When Gary, so following off of that, like it's, I, those moments happen all the time. I was having the same thing. Like, God damn it. This is what it feels like at those top levels. When really smart people who are committed to doing something together, who are very well trained, they just go. They fix problems one at a time. When Gary Sinise comes in, and he finally, he's sitting there that they finally figured out how to turn on this fucking computer so it doesn't take up more than 20 amps. And he's walking Kevin Bacon through it. And Kevin Bacon, with the first, uh, the first order, he's like, uh, it's pretty humid up here. Or not humid, it's pretty, yeah. um, <laughs> a lot of condensation. Yeah. He's like, are you sure? What happens yeah. if this thing doesn't start off? And Gary Sinise is like, you know, we'll just have to fix that if, if we, when we get there. Yeah. Just one at a time, just solving problems. And it's yeah. just, God damn it. I don't know what it is about the space age and specifically that era of mission control. See, the, but the, the way sub, they just the dealt subtext, with problem solving things. Yeah, the subtext I read into that was, I don't have an answer for you. Just flick the damn switch. Yeah, yeah. But that's we, what I'm saying. Yeah, they, we they, don't they, know. I mean, so it doesn't matter what we can do. Not flip anything. the switch. And then because there's condensation, yeah. you <laughs> yeah. got to figure it out. If, if we're starting a toaster in a bathtub, then, you know, but that's all we got. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna pose this question. Let's see what you guys say. Mm. So Ron Howard never gets involved in the conversations of Tarantino PTA, all the other people that we talk about. Um, he's probably closer. He works with Bruckheimer, but he's probably closer to like the big commercial, like um, Gore, Verbinski movies, like a lot of those bigger ones. Um, do you think he falls into like a sp- Spielbergy type thing here where he does the Spielberg thing where you always have kids or people who aren't in the know so that you can explain things that the audience needs to know to the kids. It's a very Spielbergy thing that like Kubrick wouldn't do, you know, mm. curious how a lot of those people. So we have a couple kids in this. We have the grandma and um, we have a couple people that are just not in the know that they can explain information to like, oh, honey, don't get up there. We don't want to give our germs to the astronauts before they go. You know what I mean? Like the, he does. He has that. Do you think the family friendliness because Apollo 13 is great and we all know that but do you think sometimes it doesn't have the same punch as the the the, the people that the great cinematogs revere do you think that affects this movie at all that's my difficult question for you I to do. answer those are those are my least my least favorite moments are the nostalgia traps and I feel like he does that. Maybe That's my Jimmy. Yeah, but it works for the kids. But yeah, do you think that like my Jimmy can get out of the problems? And I'm like, I actually want Ed Harris to solve this problem, really. <laughs> I want Gary Sinise to solve this problem. Jimmy's not going to solve it on his own, but I'm glad that, you know what I mean? Yeah, that, see, all right. So the nostalgia is the key word because it may be being sentimental because the thing I was just raving about, the human drama yeah. doesn't, that's that's not that shit, right? We don't. He thinks it elevates the human stuff so that people have little moments like that. Her dropping her ring into the we don't need we don't the need shower. the ring drop. There's no need for that. Uh, the kid, we don't need the ring drop. I, mean, I believe they happened. loved each other. It actually happened. Yeah, oh, that was well, that. She go. confirmed that actually happened. I, I didn't. It's right, fine. Well, it didn't hold it back for me. To be that's honest, crazy. Yeah. I still didn't know that. Um, uh, the you can buzz us for this shit, Dave. The by Beatles, the way, this is mom, <laughs> this is all I hate negative. The Sure. You hate the Beatles. I mean, you guys, no, the Beatles, what I, what uh, the takeaway from this is you guys are getting really good at white wording your negativity so it doesn't get buzzed. <laughs> it's constructive criticism. No, but I know what you mean, Jeff. And those those moments do frustrate me because I feel like um, they are what keeps Ron Howard. <laughs> Peter says going. yes, it does. <laughs> to answer my question, does it hold it back? He says yes, it does. Yes, it does. It does. I completely agree. I think it, oh, it, it doesn't Peter? make it a bad movie. It's just the worst parts of the movie. Nine out of ten, eight out of nine. Like yeah. it might round it. But hey, is it Dave? He's a fellow Aussie. You just buzzed. Uh, <laughs> just buzzed one of your. Um, he, Dave, he thanks you Dave, for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Dave, Property just, Daddy I, NYC. I just Property gave, Daddy NYC. I, I, just I just gave a fellow Aussie Peter. beer. Come on, Dave. Dave, you don't have to answer that same question. But Dave, do you do you disagree? No, do you? Yeah, do you disagree with us, or do you, does that stuff 
bother you at all or does you think it's just um no what's the point this... of that shit being in the movie <laughs> well i mean for me a lot of it was uh like in the the scene you referenced where she was like don't get too close we don't want to get our germs and they were on the opposite sides of the road uh i actually really enjoyed that because i thought yeah, that's, me too. Just, me too, that's to be something i don't that you don't that's see that's a fine scene that's not what we're talking yeah. about that's not the nostalgic stuff we're talking about the if if my are you talking about like the scenes with the grandmother oh, with yeah. neil and buzz like coming in yeah with the daughter complaining that the beatles broke up with the uh just those things where it's like the sixties or, or the seventies, you know, whatever it's like the yeah, grandpa, that, I mean, like to be, honest, the to be honest, the, there. yeah, the, the bit about the Beatles had really no point being in the movie. Well, the family, they wanted the family to have, they, they didn't want them to show up at the end. You know what I mean? If you're, mm. if you're going to have them, you got to use them. But, but then again, we didn't just, see, well, but then again, we mean, didn't see the son until the military Academy. And then that was honestly, all I needed was that if that was the only child and he was at the military Academy, I could have been fine. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's another one that I'm thinking of. Though, I know that's not the true story. Yeah, I, I, that's not what I mean. But and this is a fantastic film. It really is. But it's not 2001: A Space Odyssey, and so I decided to hold it against a really high bar. It, it's amazing. I'm just curious because, long story short, is my note was my only note was some things about this in there to get the story across that in a series, even if it's a three part. The three-parter. The first part is getting to the launch. The second part is the launch up until the problem. The third part is the figuring out the problem. The fourth part is getting them home. Like in a mini series in 2020, that's probably what they would do. We don't have that kind of time. So what you do is every now and then you just you have to spoon feed some dialogue and they do it in that way. And I was wondering if that worked for you guys. Now I'm just fucking rambling. But anyway, that, that's the thing about Apollo 13. No, no, no. That, that, that's the thing. But it doesn't work for you. But you're saying it doesn't work for it you. It does for me because I saw it when I was a child. So I do remember that. However, when the grandma said, that's my Jimmy, I went, I remembered this better when I was a child. Yeah, I mean, I was I was gonna, like, is your is your Spielberg grandpa right. grandpa thing and, and going I'm happy, Like I know you usually say grandpa humor. And I'm happy but... with the, are you guys in space? With the Buzz Aldrin, when, when she meets Buzz Aldrin, who apparently Buzz Aldrin. Are you boys in the space? Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong <laughs> yes. are single and they just travel everywhere together, of course. But like, <laughs> they just show the party <laughs> by themselves and sit next to grandma. But no, but I'm, I mean, I'm serious. As far as rewatching and stuff, it's it, Apollo 13 is always going to be a nine. It's going to have a lot of 10 moments. But I'm okay with just You're giving it a nine. I'm, I'm a, okay. It's a high rating, dude. Mm-hmm. It's a, this is a fantastic film. But I'm okay yeah, with Jeff, I'm that, okay. That drink that drink label is going to stay there till you do. <laughs> I'm okay it's with great, watching the, the hits of this movie more than rewatching the whole thing. I'm I'm ready to go to YouTube and just watch the problem scenes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Th- yes. Yeah. I know what you mean. Especially it, you were telling me that you felt like it flew leading up to when they got into space. I feel like some of these moments where they're really yeah, the, trying to get the in the relationships no, yeah no, I feel the like scenes kind of the were going quick I, I don't necessarily you're right okay let me let me rethink the way i said that it didn't fly in the sense that that 25 minutes went quick it flew in the sense that if you really broke it down there were 20 second scenes that had a full set director our makeup everything and it was three lines got the exposition move on but that doesn't mean that like we got to space and i was like how did we get here? You know what I mean? I'm just, I just mean that they like, mm-hmm. it's almost like those scenes started out as a minute and then they chopped them down to 15 seconds. If that makes sense. Yes. Mm. It feels a, a lot of times I feel like this movie and a lot of this movies, if I'm being honest, feel like, like that kind of movie you're talking about. Where like, if Tom Hanks wasn't a brilliant actor, that scene where he's talking to his son about the door not working and how they fix the door and you have nothing to be scared about, that would be cheesy as fuck in the hands of someone who wasn't a genius. Like, oh, that perfect, absolute perfect fucking moment where the wife is like listening as soon as he like says that moment. There's nothing there's nothing pedestrian about it. So I feel like it can't really get to that next level of drama where you feel like you're you're just voyeuristically witnessing real life in the middle of trauma and tragedy. It doesn't ever get there because it feels and there is a safety to that. If you're if we're going to keep telling that line where you're talking about, it does create a safety. So even though there's a lot of suspense to this movie, and I still agree with you, Dave. No matter how much I watch this, I'm always like, how does this end? But I'm never super scared, not because of the story, just because I'm in the hands of Ron Howard. <laughs> does that make sense? <laughs> of course. P- Peter, it's a 10. Sense. Peter, yeah. 2001's a 10. P- 2001's a 10. Yeah. We already talked it's, about it. It's, it's a 12. It's a 12. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm rambling. It's Apollo 13. We know Apollo 13. I think it's fantastic. I brought up that point. I mean, it was more so about the spielberg effect where it has the family friendly, the child friendly. Is that good or bad? It's the 90s. So family friendly was usually generally a good thing. Um, but would it be grittier in 2020? I think the answer is yes. 
that's what I would say about that. Dave, anything else that I'm missing? Anything else you want to talk about effects wise? Do you love the way they did the oxygen? Did we actually land on the moon in 1969? Whatever you want to talk about. No, no, no. And we don't get Cooper, into that can uh, of worms. We did, by the way. I think it would be harder to fake than to actually go. To yeah, absolutely. Dave, that was the first time they used uh, CG. That was the first time Ron Howard used CG. I remember mm. him talking about his master class with the uh, the launch. Yep. Uh, the fire and the flame was the first time they had ever fucked with it in his company. And I thought it looked great. I thought, yeah, it, was, I thought it held up pretty well. His, uh, in his own words, it's one of the most cinematic things he's ever done. I think so, too. And that right? lunar module yeah, is a in Arrested <laughs> Development. <laughs> um... <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, All right, <laughs> friends. Again, this is another film that we could talk about more if we want. And I and again, I want to admit to anybody. I said again a lot. I love this film. I think it's a nine. I really, 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 really do. That's it. Um, any final yeah, thoughts about it? Too much fun to watch. Dave, you ready to roll the I'm random year generator one. for us? I'm ready to roll Let's it. Let's do it. Let's see what we're talking about next week. It? What year are we going to be talking about? We All have. All right. Dave, spin this thing. Spin this shit. Okay, so next week, and for those of you joining us on Facebook Live, thanks for joining us. Uh, you'll have to listen to the episode to find out. Did you we just cut us off. I cut the. <laughs> I cut Facebook Live off. Yes, we're. Uh, you, you don't get it. We don't give it all away for free, guys. Come on, we're going to 1962 oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. next week. Oh, okay, fine. All right, 1962. Fine. We will talk about 60s. which films to discuss, and we'll see you in a second with our guest host, Jeff Ronan. Jeff, I hope you've been drinking. See you soon, <laughs> film fans. <laughs> We're back. We're back. <laughs> we're oh back. my gosh, we're back, and there we have a special guest with us. We have a special guest who I am going to hype up <laughs> oh, so so yeah. well, so 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 well. But first, friends. But first, <laughs> best but way to first. enter everything in life. We uh, are going to be talking about <laughs> Batman Forever, nineteen ninety. Five. Of course, if you had just listened to our previous segment here, we are going to announce which three films from 1962 we are going to be watching next week. <laughs> That's exciting. End of this segment. End of this segment, you'll hear the films that will be on our next podcast. I believe all of them are streamable for free, so stick around so you can catch up and watch live with us next week. But first, we have to get to Batman Forever, 1995. This is where Tim Burton said, no, 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 I'll produce. I just did two pretty successful Batman films with Michael Keaton. Let's let Ju Joel Schumacher take over. Oh, Michael Keaton doesn't want to work with Joel Schumacher. Okay, Val Kilmer is in. Who's the biggest star in the world right now? Jim Carrey. Let's get him to be Edward Nigma. Who else do we got? Oh, this is right after The Fugitive with Tommy Lee Jones. Let's get Tommy Lee Jones. Oh, they don't like working together? Doesn't matter, people. We are talking about Batman forever. <laughs> Right but now, before... here are the numbers. <laughs> wait, wait. These are the numbers. On Best Rotten Tomatoes, ever. Batman Forever, Batman Forever, 39% tomato meter. But don't worry, because the audience score is lower. It is 32% <laughs> on Rotten Tomatoes. On IMDb, it's at 54 which I think might be generous. All right, Batman Forever, Joel <laughs> Schumacher, Val Kilmer. <laughs> John, a drink during the while intro? I drink, you, go ahead and introduce our fucker. guest. All right, yeah. So before we talk about Batman Forever, I just want to give a little shout out. Our guest name is Jeff Ronan. He what, is what? the co-host of the podcast, the movie podcast, and almost starring. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that pod, dude? Welcome, welcome to the love yeah. of cinema. Oh, first of all, so thrilled, cheers, so cheers. thrilled. Hey, I'm you know what, Dave? Dave, buzzing. <laughs> oh, I'm drinking. <laughs> to write a passage. Oh my god, my first buzz! I'm so so thrilled, uh, oh, so glad. I'm loving loving being here on the love of cinema, guys. Uh, Thank yeah. You. Uh, so oh, so uh, and almost starring is a podcast I run with my wife, Amy Jo Jackson, where each week we take a film, break down all the actors who almost starred, all the actors who were almost cast, and what could have been for better and sometimes for hilariously worse. And a wide batch of films. Oh yes, Jeff. Can I can I throw something at you? Okay, so we just talked Please. about Apollo thirteen. Tom yes. Hanks's career is thanks to other people turning down roles. True or false? 
I mean, you could argue a lot of people's careers are are like that. I mean, all the people. I mean, we haven't done big <laughs> yet, but offhand, I know that Robert De Niro turned down big, and that's what really you know got Tom Hanks that oh first my Oscar God. nom. Oh, I oh, know. Oh, De Niro. Hold on, I know. Uh, <laughs> wait, t- I thought f- first choice Sleepless in Seattle. And I also saw for big was James Brooks. So a lot of turndowns. Dan Day Lewis for Philadelphia. Tom Hanks. Thank you, everybody yeah. turning down roles. Thank every everybody. 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 I mean, there's so All many the cases. Time, so many right? cases that like are people just sneaking in there of uh, getting those getting those roles. But yeah, we we love co- we cover a wide range of films. Everything from The Matrix, Jurassic Park, Clueless, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Mortal yes. Kombat. Very eclectic. Yes. 1994. Uh, Five, right? Isn't that a nineteen ninety five? Yes, and, movie? and keep it keep it in theme. <laughs> yeah. Keep it in theme with nineteen ninety five. Uh we just had John on talking to die for uh the other nineteen ninety uh nineteen ninety five movie with Nicole Kidman, the uh black yes. comedy by Gus Van Sant, uh and all the actors considered for that. Uh and we just had a write up on A V Club that just dropped last week about uh our uh episode on Alien. So uh go Congrats, go man. check that out. Thanks. Thank you guys. Uh but yeah, oh, yeah. I'm so thrilled. I can't believe you knew to pick Batman Forever for when you were having me on the the movie of my youth. <laughs> You're welcome. You're Wait, welcome. I agree with this. Let's then, let's, then let's segue into this. So, so let's segue into this because I feel that I feel the same way. When when I knew this was part of the series, this is the movie. Now it is partly because my childhood, Jim Carrey, has a big part of because I was young in that 1994 year mm-hmm. where he does Dumb and Dumber, The Mask, and Ace Ventura. And this is 1995, the next year. So he he is, by all accounts, the biggest movie star in the world because of the success of all three of his first films. And this film was on TV all the goddamn time when I was younger. And it's also, so I know the ending so cheap. well because I've seen, the, I've seen the ending. Come on, Dave. I've seen the ending 12 <laughs> times. I don't know if I've seen the beginning 12 times, but because I would turn it on halfway through or three quarters of the way through, I would watch till the end. So talk to me. So you've seen this movie a lot in your youth, Jeff. So so many times. This was I don't remember if I saw this in theaters. I remember seeing Batman and Robin in theaters. I remember seeing those that skydiving from the air nonsense after, you know, yeah. ice to meet you. Uh, but this was one that I saw so many times. It is probably, yeah, Jim Carrey, for me. Chill out. Oh, chill out, man. The <laughs> trifecta, for me, is the trifecta of uh, this, The Mask, and Liar, Liar were the three big yeah. Jim Carrey movies that, for me, I watched constantly on loop growing up. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what it was about this film, but I loved it. I mean, it is kind of, it's definitely more geared towards kids than the Tim Burton ones were, which certainly helps when you're eight years old and it's not too terrifying uh because it's just a it, it's crazy that this movie is more of a cartoon than batman the animated series <laughs> i don't necessarily yeah. mean that is a bad thing and but was, it yeah. absolutely is dave's that hand was my is shit on the buzzer kid. right yeah, now yeah my he finger is, is like, hovering around, around the buzzer <laughs> I'm like, Ooh, that was close that was close <laughs> oh i'm just just jeff speaking by. jeff do you, jeff our jeff do you need to set up our this jeff movie? no no no, no we're all our jeff <laughs> <laughs> do i need to set up this movie okay so did you say the plot so, did you say the plot already i can't remember no, sure. man, it was a plot I did not. okay so this is number three um dave dave loves this movie so this is his favorite movie okay so so honestly it's a story of two villains so you got batman must battle former district attorney harvey dent who is now two-face also played by tommy lee jones and edward nigma the riddler played by jim carrey with the help from an, an amorous psychologist and a young circus acrobat who becomes his sidekick, Robin. I actually thought when they said, with help from, I thought they were going to go Nicole Kidman here. So anyway, it's Batman versus two villain. This movie definitely has the two villain problem. Jeff, <laughs> back to you. You just rewatched this. This is a movie of your, your, your youth. Did you realize that it would be a movie that soon people would talk about on a redemption segment of their podcast, or was it really that bad? Did you know, when, when did you know? Did you know it in this rewatch, or did you know it sooner? Um, well, it wasn't quite like I was wondering, oh, well, is it 7 or Apollo 13 that's the redemption movie? Because clearly it can't be Batman Forever. Get the I, fuck I, that yeah. shit. Get the fuck get, out of here. <laughs> get out. Uh, I do want to pause, though, because the way you did describe that, Jeff, was an amorous psychologist and the uh, like an acrobat that becomes robin you that oh, didn't different. make it sound like that's all one person which would be infinitely say, better yeah, infinitely <laughs> better than <laughs> chris o'donnell like, <laughs> why did robin I mean, go to school if he chris just O'Donnell, wants to join the family <laughs> that, i mean one of the, this movie's got a couple pro- this movie does have a couple problems it is still an incredible film from my youth but uh i mean one the fact that they booted billy d williams as harvey 
and got yeah, and not cool. Who, he, he'd been Harvey. I mean, he was wow. waiting for the chance. Uh, but also, Chris O'Donnell and Val Kilmer clearly want to fuck this entire film, and they just let him kiss, let him make out because yeah. Chris O'Donnell's pretending to play what uh, I, I think he's supposed to be college age. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. My foot. Mm. Uh, <laughs> No, we can yeah, curse when on Chris O'Donnell's like when when he's like I'm gonna go out here I'm gonna do it and they're they're in the Batcave and Val Kilmer has his shirt off and Chris O'Donnell's like who's gonna stop me and Batman's oh. like I'll stop you I was like hit the yeah. funk music I'll stop you as lower soon as the yeah. drapes, baby. Like this these grease. guys are yeah. about to the, one of them is about to enter but first as Jeff would say into, <laughs> into frame oh, I mean wow. that is a plus from Michael Keaton Michael Keaton love 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 Michael Keaton but that was all padding in that suit Val Kilmer got in some shape for this film I mean honestly yeah. give, give us some more bare chested Batman he worked yeah. on it people he all has the nipples lo- this, this, since- suit, this suit had nipples yeah, yeah, that this, was this just was him. That, that was that was his Val's pokey that's nipples so, going so, right his, through that rubber. That was <laughs> that was actually a, a design Kilmer, choice because they wanted to base it on uh, on basically the Greek statues. Now Val Kilmer <clears throat> has lost that shape in years since, but you know, once once was De- enough. decades uh, since. I wrote I wrote that uh, this was Chris O'Donnell's audition for Moulin Rouge, but the part went to Nicole Kidman. Would you agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> Chris I O'Donnell was a fly. He was the Flying Willenda. No, I forget what his name was in the movie, but like he was, it was basically based on the Flying Willenda family, and he was a circus acrobat who apparently took a bomb to the roof. It doesn't matter. It, this movie was fun. It was a cartoon. I guess yeah. it was sitcommy. It was colorful. I have no idea what the fuck was going on in a lot of these scenes. I was in the middle of the scene, and I went, "Where are we?" In half of these. Yeah. But, right, I, right, I, right, but right, I'm right, with you, on. Jeff. Where I thought it was really fun. So I am a. I think Dave and I will will cheers to this. I am hardcore about number one and two. I am a Tim Burton Batman fan. Mm. Like I, those movies yeah. sculpted my outlook on life. <laughs> like I love those movies. So I had a tough time with this one, mostly just out of the aesthetic difference between Tim Burton's style, who produced this, and Joel Shoemaker, who give it up to Joel. We'll pour one out for that guy. He passed this past year. Joel, ah. well done, Joel Shoemaker. Um, this, but I, so I, fr- I was frustrated with this movie my entire childhood. And then I had a blast on this rewatch, you guys. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm going to have to no, retreat. This it, it movie, fun. this movie, and Joel Shoemaker's take, he clearly went into the room and he said, I am going to make the 1960s show come to life in the movie. Exactly. This, exactly. this yeah. is this, it, it had the same feel, the absurdity that it went beyond comical. Cause, you know, Burton has that ability to take Burton's style, which is not realistic, and, set it with a tone that is supposed to be taken as though it was realism. This is not realism for, for one fucking second, right? Where no one is under the illusion that the Gotham actually looks like this, that people actually talk to each other like that, that those guys aren't fucking each other as soon as they take their suits off. We know something's up. We know the style is weird. And this was the first time it didn't, it didn't turn me off the whole time. I still was able to enjoy the story. I just didn't take it seriously. I wasn't expecting to have a dramatic experience the way I was with the first two, especially the second one, which, you know, it's kind of, it is a pretty stark change from Batman Returns, mm. which is super dark, very dramatic. And, you know, again, aside yeah, from other production nightmare design, inducing. That is, is nightmare grounded. inducing. Yeah, I mean, it is grounded. This is not grounded. This is something else, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's like walking oh, out no. your front door and the fucking floor is missing. All right, D- Dave, I, I, go off, motherfucker. I want to hear why do you, why do you well, hate this movie so well, much? Hold on, maybe, maybe the floor isn't missing, but it is full of boiling acid. As uh, <laughs> that guy, the, that like, guy, I, everything. I, oh, I enjoy the movie, but that guy is one of that guy's one of the worst off? actors I've ever seen. That, yeah. is, no, that, that, that man has the greatest. That is the greatest day player of all time. He's the My most feet are annoying, The most. <laughs> stop giving him lines. He's the most fucking annoying character ever. <laughs> God, I, I may as well so just hold funny. this. It's boiling they could have, acid. They could, have, they could have easily said one more and less. That's all yeah. they needed to say. I, I mean, I, I really, I really enjoyed. I, I kind of enjoyed watching Val Kilmer, Kilmer and the hundred impossibly unbelievable things in the first five minutes. Um, mm-hmm. I, that was the official title. It wouldn't fit on the poster. Though. It was too wordy. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> did you like this very first line? Val did Kilmer's you like the very first the line? Title. What's the first line of this movie? I'll get drive through. Yeah. Well, well, like, well, the first line is Alf- whatever Alfred's. Oh, yes, yeah, sandwich, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah also, right. how, how do you name this movie Batman Forever? And the fourth one is Batman and Robin. This should be Batman and Robin. And then the fourth one, you do Batman number four ever. It was, is a strike. Yeah. Is Whoa, a strike. Fast and Furious stuff going on there. 
Yeah, yeah yes, exactly. I don't know. The I mean, Bat and I, the Furious. I will say, there's a couple of things I will say. Tommy Lee Jones steals this movie for me because I did not, when I first saw this in cinemas, I did not see him coming. I was like, Tommy Lee Jones is doing Two Face and he just fucking owned it. And I, I did not know Tommy Lee Jones was, was capable choice. of going to that level. Like it was a, it was a, for me, it was a, it was a choice. It was a really, Jeff didn't like it. It was really Jeff, different Jeff, to, Jeff um, like it. it was really different Sorry, to what no, you normally like see him it. doing. Um, the editing though is what really kills me in this movie. It kills the entire fucking thing. There was a whole other scene originally before the opening sequence um, that they just cut out and it showed like the investigative side a little bit more of, of the Batman and they cut it and just went to this campy fucking action sequence to open the movie. And I'm sorry, it just, it opens weak, slowly tries to climb out of the toilet and just doesn't get there. Do you... It's definitely not as good as the first two. Do you guys <laughs> agree with that? Me, or are you, are you guys arguing... I agree with that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah are, are you arguing for Batman Forever over the Tim Burton's? I, I'm I'm certainly not. I do think it's definitely a step down from the previous two. I mean, I loved it as a kid. I do think it is more geared to a younger audience than those first two. For me, I think the problem is with the villains. I think the Tommy Lee Jones got hindered by he feels like he's doing Joker 2.0. It feels like he's like, oh, you got my boy Jack Nicholson, fellow Academy Award winner, doing doing this. I can do okay, great. This isn't beneath me to do this, but it feels like there's a, only a few moments where I feel like he's actually doing a like split personality performance where it's mm. like, yeah, and now I'm exactly. like very calm and collected and now I'm a cartoon. He does that cartoon laugh so often. And I wonder if he just got, he saw what Jim Carrey was doing and he was like, fuck, let me go full tilt boogie then. Cause I don't know, I'm going to look like I'm doing like Pinter yeah. against whatever Pinter. this is that's <laughs> Jesus happening. Christ. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm actually with both of you, Dave and Jeff, because yes, Tech, yes, he came in with some really fucking strong choices for sure. But then he realized that Jim Carrey's presence was something because he never was Harvey Dent. He was always the laughing sidekick. And in fact, that was the problem with the two villain part of this is that the two villains became a team and they weren't one identity. They were Edward Nygma with Two Faces endorsement, if that makes sense. Like Edward, he became that like second character, like the second part of it. If he did, if he did the Two Face thing and then he countered it. With a Harvey Dent that was grounded, John, I think that could have been something really, really, really special. But Jim Carrey stole the movie for better or worse, and apparently for worse for for him because I my line here is I don't know if you saw anything. Apparently, Tommy Lee Jones hated working with um, yeah. Jim Carrey, and he said, "I cannot sanction your buffoonery." I think Jim Carrey was fucking <laughs> with him, and that's the line that I wrote down. I cannot sanction your buffoonery. I, I wish that I had made it in the that. edit. Um, one thing I will go. The one thing good thing that came out of it was uh, like <laughs> Jim Jim Carrey. No, when if if I. I mean, this is just a personal choice, and I've thought about it a lot. If I was if I was directing Jim Carrey, I would have pulled him back as much as possible because there's some really subtle things that he does with the character that you he had see, moments where he was yeah, really subtle that you see, and it, then he goes over the top, and you lose it, and it's like everyone's trying to be you know heightened and stuff. But if he pulled it back, I think it would have been a lot more sinister, and it would have had a lot more effect because um, the in uh, Gotham, the series Gotham, uh, Corey Michael Smith ended up playing the Riddler. And I actually sat forward in a chair for a second because there's one scene where he gets told something he doesn't like in Batman Forever and you see Jim Carrey react. And I'm like, holy fuck, like Corey Michael Smith is like channeling subdued Jim Carrey for this role because like the reaction literally was the same. And there's so many times where you see like what he took from, I think was probably inspired a little bit from this performance, yeah. but he grounded it and it works so much better than what Jim Carrey did in this film. Right. Although the, yeah, the most yeah. the the most overtop thing in the movie though was actually not Jim Carrey. It was Chris O'Donnell's laundry sequence. What the fuck oh. was that? I did not remember that. He was like he was doing a he was literally he was like Alfred. I don't need anybody waiting on me. And then he takes the laundry out of the dryer and he like spins it in the air and catches the rock it on a music. Yeah. The music the underneath music. it. That was actually the most over the top thing. Wait even, wait wait. Even, let me send it back to Jeff. Alfred's like hmm. Let me let me wait. Let, let me send it back to Jeff though because there's something. Yeah, even yeah, Alfred was sitting there and was like, "Oh, I don't need okay. to take care of you." You oh, got the this deviant art community was ready for to make that threesome okay, of Batman, you, yeah, Robin, yeah, and dude, Alfred. Don't you, even worry about you it. You know your movie is camp when you've turned Alfred. Look, so. we're, we're, <laughs> okay, we're off the rails. I'm gonna kick it back already to Jeff there, with this because okay, so so there. long story short, Batman has a two villain problem. It is not anybody who has seen The Dark Knight and that's their idea of Batman. That comes from the Tim Burton like idea of that dark, like haunting whatever mythology you want. 
this is so it's camp to the point where the grounded stuff doesn't solidify like anything in any sense of reality so it's basically batman against these two villains and that's that but the things that you remember from this movie are the lines and most of those lines are jim carrey's and i don't think there's any question about that it's not drew barrymore it's not debbie well, mazer it's not okay. nicole kidman there's if so you, many people yeah. in this if you it's, wanna, because, it's, it's, it's because it's riddle me this riddle me that who's afraid of the big black flat etc so jeff even though this is not going to give you nightmares the way that the other two is going to give you them are the lines enough of to be like, uh, let's say um, this is random, but like a happy Gilmore where it's like, I don't know what this, you know, the, like the lines I, I go to hear the rewatchable lines is, you is it enough to give breakfast? it a fun rewatch? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is, is it enough? Cause the lines are really memorable. I, I can't forget these lines. Whereas I don't remember any lines from the first two Batman movies. Uh, I did find, uh, what? I did find joygasm and spank me. Very memorable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As you do, you could buzz me for that because I thought those were that was like that's when I was like completely out of it. Where I was like, no, why would you? Because I think this is why I would always go back to the mask and liar, liar is because he's given within the context of the script, he's given reins. Because in the mask, he's like Stanley Ipkiss, so he's purposely like, okay, here I'm a human being, or at least like the more whatever milk toast right. guy, and then the right. mask is full id. And liar, liar, it's him fighting against that id. Whereas this, it's just open id. And that was never my favorite Jim Carrey, when it's just you open up the valve, and it's just there's nothing tempering it or keeping mm. it down. Because um, to me, it just really feels like you're just improvising. And it's like Robin Williams, who was an incredible comedic performer, but like, you know, letting him do Genie, and it's like the poor sound engineer that had to edit out... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> edit that down to 20 minutes when it was yeah, 18 the, hours the, yeah, the, just like i just like Robin, i'm a hot dog Robin, and, we, we've yeah, been in the that's, studio that's for three feel. days stop doing yeah, coke I, ex- that's like, <laughs> that's that's you, you gave him a week and a pound of coke you could make a movie out of anything he said like <laughs> man i don't think jim carrey even needed coke i feel like you could just if you got like if he gave blood you could just use that and you would get high off it of, of 1985 era Jim Carrey. So I think that he just needed pretty much Joel described the plot of Blue, to True Blood. Rain him in. Yeah, um, I think you guys are right. Even him before he, he becomes full blown Riddler, when he's like in his old whole like Jeffrey Dahmer, <laughs> Hank Hinkley look. Uh, yeah, he cleans up really nice. He cleans up. Really he nice. really does. Well, once he's hmm. literally just doing a Val Kilmer play when he's got the Val Kilmer hair and glasses. But you're saying Ed Enigma is too much too. I feel like when he's even the that, first scene. I mean surfs up big kahuna to the poor yeah. poor ed begley jr even then it's like you know it'd be ed one begley thing if he jr. like oh now he's snapped and now he's going com- completely bananas but right from the jump he's just so over the top and that's that really to me it's him specifically why this is more of a cartoon than batman the animated series and uh, if he was more of- Sure, please. <laughs> yeah. But I, won- yeah. I wonder if he was either more reined in or if you had someone else in that role, if everyone else could have breathed a little more, because uh, it does dominate the film so much in a way that it does, I do think does hinder it slightly. Mm. I do too. I think he, I think he, if they would have gone, if Tim Burton would have directed this and ca- cast Kevin Spacey as the Riddler, this movie would be very different. <laughs> well, we like, wouldn't be uh, watching it anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But something like that about the reined in, I, I, I agree with what you guys are saying, but I also feel like just the script in general, unlike the first two and definitely unlike Nolan's, again, it feels like that TV show, not just in tone, but it also feels episodic. So I don't feel like I learned anything about Batman in this one. This installment didn't move Batman's uh, story, his personal demons forward at all. Nothing changed for him in this except for Robin. Hmm. So we didn't get to see him deal with a new struggle in the, you know, with whatever he's been dealing with big picture wise. Whereas in the first two, you did get it. They abandoned it with this one. They abandoned it with Batman and Robin. Jesus. Sorry, Dave. I hit my microphone really hard. And, uh, and then Nolan picks it up and tries to tell very specific personal stories, which again, kind of to the theme of what we've been talking about with seven and Apollo 13, there was, there was a, there was zero humanity in this movie. It was just clowns. I thought, and I'm going to throw Tommy Lee in there too. I felt like everybody was clowning it up. So Val Kilmer almost, I don't really have an opinion on him as Batman because I felt like he was dominated by the villains and the whatever they were trying to do with the relationship between Batman and Robin, it wasn't grounded either. And because I had no point of view from Batman up until the point I met Robin, I don't really feel like I had enough to say about Robin because I, I didn't know how Batman felt about anything. Until, you know, when Robin came inside, they didn't give me a single intimate 
moment with him before that happened. Yeah, do, I mean, do you know what I mean? Do you agree let's, with that? Let's take, let's take a minute to talk about the supporting actors in this because, like, Val Kilmer and Why is Drew Barrymore in this movie? <laughs> This was before no, she was the Why the fuck is she in this movie? I, I, she just came off Poison Ivy. She was like 18. Yeah. Uh, no, but like, I want to talk about the supporting actors, Val Kilmer and Nicole Kidman. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, dude. Which Seriously. one of the five writers on this film was writing their fucking dialogue? I'm sorry. Honestly. There are five really, writers. Really... No, I like, will say that. I, w- I want them punished. I want them punished. Who was five? writing the dialogue for that? It was oh, fucking you, you wanted the Punisher. Were... You wanted the Punisher to come in. Hmm. Uh, there I mean, were, hey, yeah. Prop, props to this film, though. Is this the only time that Batman ever goes to therapy? Because that is, <laughs> I don't think it's successful, but I do think that's an element that, like, yes, this is a man that is in desperate need of therapy. Yeah. Yeah. And he, it feels like he starts to, Does like, it... I'm going to give up being Batman. I don't know what then makes him just being like, oh, no, I'm cool now that I've got my Does it Robin count if the here. only reason he went was trying to bang the therapist? Ooh, good point. Good it does point. count. In Batman world, it does. It does count. This I, I, I mean, I, basically I did, went I did, Batman I did, forever yeah. in New Jersey. I did <laughs> I did feel like Val Kilmer seemed more comfortable with Bruce Wayne than Batman when he was playing the role. Yeah. Well, again, though, I mean, yeah, I, feel like, I feel like the line between... I know this is going to get very specific, but like that scene I was making fun of when he's like, he goes into the shower way too quickly. He comes out of that shower lightning speed. Remember when he parks his car and Chris O'Donnell's waiting for him and he walks through the room and he's totally undressed with a shot with a towel around his neck. Like he just took a shower. Anyway, in the first two and in Nolan's movies, there is at least one scene in each of them where you get to see Batman with his mask off, but he's still caped up. He's still got his costume on Mm. and you kind of get to see him sitting in conflict where like, it doesn't quite line up, and he usually has some kind of exchange at, in the second or you know climax of the well, second did act. Did he use the back computer once? Struggling with something. Did he use the back computer once no. during this movie? No, no, no. He didn't do any of his usual things. Shame. He had his gadgets on his person, but they he, never. He didn't that stuff. need the computer. He was too busy using his de- deductive reasoning to figure out the brilliant riddle of Mister E. Oh, you mean he's what was penis. the point? What was the That's point true. of all the riddles to be like, oh, Mister E, Mister E, Enigma? It did uh, like yeah. it was like who cares? It doesn't matter. I was like you didn't real. I I, yeah. I didn't realize he didn't know it was Enigma at that point. Yes. Okay. So now, the, when did the? I'm trying to remember when the cartoon started. The one that we've kind of been poking fun of, the Dark Knight cartoon. I was definitely uh, a child still, so I feel like it was around the early nineties. Ninety two. Ninety two. I think was Batman the animated series. The one with Mark okay, Hamill. You mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like this movie again. Tim Burton did a good job, I think, of bringing Batman back to the front of the story. Because even in the 60s show, like, Batman kind of became, you know, Adam West eventually started playing him because it was so episodic. Like, you knew what to expect. So he kind of was just the Batman in the context of Justice League and the hero of Gotham. Burton resurrected him as an interesting, conflicted protagonist, an antihero. And then the cartoon took it to a whole other level. It's the Dark Knight cartoon. And he is at the center of all of it, struggling every th- with emotions all over the place. And I, I do feel like this movie like really just dropped the ball on that part of it. It became about a lot of the other things. It became about all the people around him, the villains, which is just like the 60s TV show. It became about the villains. And it became about the spectacle. And I didn't feel anything. And like anyone who loves Batman, I love Batman. I think a lot of people love Batman. Mm. Is that that character, as we talked about before on the show, is the best superhero of all time because of his natural conflict. He, he's not Superman. He doesn't have a lot of the luxuries. He's not a superhero. He's a human. He's a fucked up human. And I don't think I, even though you're right, Jeff, I, he did go to therapy. But he seemed <laughs> extremely cool, calm, and collected. Even when he was looking at that ink blot, the Warshot test, he was like, oh, bats. And I was like, all right, cool. They gave us like one little moment of that because he didn't have a single moment of conflict in front of her or alone there's something about starting a movie in action which is what this did and it set up a very green very strange world that it's hard you have to ground it soon so that we know what our reality is because that all of a sudden there's the head of the Statue of Liberty, so I guess we're in New York City. <laughs> but maybe with Gotham maybe written on it, just a, so you know where you are. Maybe that, yeah, but maybe that's just a cheap. But maybe that's just the cheap Planet of the Apes reference. So it's like even his home. <laughs> I, I, where is his fucking home in relation to the city? Chris O'Donnell ske- steals the Batmobile, 
and then goes to the city. But uh, well, what, what, how far did he have to drive to get there? These things might not seem like they matter. And maybe in a sitcom, they yada yada, those kinds of things. But we, we'd we be in action. There was the one time where there's the bat signal and then he shows up and then there's Two-Face. I, I don't want to, I, I, I hesitate to go to like the Dark Knight, but just as a reference, like we would never just happen upon Heath Ledger's Joker. Like to get there is a journey and then you get there and he's the climax of this journey that you have to confront. All of a sudden now we're in a battle with, Two face in the middle of nowhere that I don't know anything about. How did we get there? And it's just like, I, I'm I'm with you all that it's there's some really fun moments in this. There's some really like spec like there is some good scene work, but it's just grounded in nothing, and that's just really too bad. Val Kilmer had, no had Val Kilmer had no chance, right? And he could yeah. he still could have gotten another movie. He could have done the George Clooney movie next, but but he had no chance of ever competing with Michael Keaton with what he was given. It's just Do- the, it's the trap. Go ahead. Go, Jeff. Go. I was going to say, do you think that would have been different? Because if they had not bought out Billy D. Williams' contract, if he they'd kept him on as Harvey Dent, they probably would have, the beginning would have been like him becoming Two-Face. Or they would have done it like they do, where it's like the news report where you're like, yeah. well, you don't need to see right. how he became Two-Face. You know, now he's suddenly Two-Face. To be face. honest, I talked but, up, I talked up uh, that at the beginning, the, the performance there, and I, I would be just as happy seeing Billy D. Williams do that. Uh, cause I think he would have bought something really cool to the party as well. And you're, and then you're seeing your villain is like from previous films. It's not yeah. just like suddenly dropping in where, even though it's the same character, it doesn't feel like, oh, we've recast it, but this is the same character you've seen in these previous films from Tim Burton. Now you're seeing right. him, but played by Tommy Lee Jones. It feels like a completely brand new, you know, half, uh, hmm. uh, it's, Ivan ooze. It's almost like DC two-face. doesn't know how to franchise or something. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Yo, look, here's I, the deal. These I, I, superhero ooh. movies, superhero movies, I think they only really work for across the board, not just hardcore fans, when they're not only fun. And I feel like this one had no goal other than fun, fun time in the theater, eat mm. your popcorn, look at these lights, listen to Jim Carrey. It yeah. never transcended anything past that. So, you know, I probably wouldn't have rewatched this movie had we not done that. Again, I had a decent rewatch. But it did not affect me emotionally. And like, don't you, I don't care if they're wearing capes and a mask. I want to be affected emotionally by Dude, anything my, I commit to. My biggest takeaway from this movie was those side facing wheels on the Batmobile would be perfect for New York City parking. <laughs> oh, that's a great point. Oh, no, no. How could you buzz that? Come on. For, forget par- parallel parking, a thing of the past. Now we're talking, guys. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, friends, by by air. <laughs> we could talk about this forever. And especially since we have our other guests, it, it is, we almost seem like we want to go on and on and just continue this conversation. But unfortunately, this is segment three in our podcast. So we have to wrap it up. Jeff, thank you for getting drunk for this quick, tiny oh, little segment. So go ahead. Another pleasure. plug. I, I know you recently did Alien. Any other movies that you that you just talked about or anything you want to plug going forward? Rain uh, yeah, we, uh, some recent episodes. Yeah, we did Alien, uh, Silence of the Lambs, Hitchcock Psycho, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and of course, To Die For with John Say. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey. And shall we sh- shall we say that you do this with your wife, who, by the way, I know you your wife. Know. I did an acting class yes. with Amy Jo. And That's our right. friend. That's right. Our friend Katie that we went to college with was uh, Ariel in The Little Mermaid, and I believe Amy oh, Jo was yeah. Ursula. In she Arkansas sure Rapporteur she sure too. was. Amazing. So, yeah. Amazing. But yeah. Oh, cool. Wow. All we need is Kevin Bacon. All, all we need is guests, and then Apollo I have a connection to everybody in Apollo 13. <laughs> oh my Kevin god, Bacon as circle. King Triton in Little Mermaid. Jeff, what are your? Uh, <laughs> do you have any handles? Do you have any? You follow stuff? Do you have any? Uh, yeah, you can you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at and almost starring. Uh, we every Saturday we say what film we're doing next. Every Friday, Amy Joe runs an Instagram game where you can try and guess. She'll drop some clues, and you can try and figure out what film we'll be doing. Uh, yeah, check us out there. And uh, oh, oh, thanks so awesome. much again. Thanks so much for having me. This has been a blast. Such a joy to rewatch Batman forever, and probably never rewatch it again. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, that's the line. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. All right, next week, well, we'll, we'll 19... definitely have you on again, dude. Next week, 1962, we are going to be doing three fantastic films. The first one is To Kill a Mockingbird. It is has a polarized uh, book this past year in 2020 with everything going on, but we are going to do the film. It's a fantastic yeah. film, and we will we're talk more there. about that. Our second film. Have you guys ever seen The um, the Feud? Shit. Can you can you hype this up, John? What, what's the Betty Davis? Whatever happened to Baby Jane? Yeah, what, yeah, Betty what was Jane the TV show? Joan, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, dude. 
And it's it's just feud. That... It's cleaner. Yeah. It's yeah. just nice Dude. social network <laughs> reference. Get and the fuck out. Get, and we're coming in and then, swinging with an absolute classic. But was it really that then, bad? Uh, our redemption film, Godzilla vs. King Kong. Or I, I, should, I said it wrong. King Kong vs. Godzilla. King Kong vs. Yeah, Godzilla vs. King, King Kong comes out next, on... next year. <laughs> it's available for free on YouTube. All of these are available for streaming. The Betty Davis one is on the Criterion Collection, HBO Max for, no, Prime Video for To Kill a Mockingbird. That's it from us. Can't wait to see you talk about 1962 films. Jeff, you want to say the last line to get us out of here? No? <laughs> no, please, please. Thanks, film fans. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Rebel me!